All right, good, good evening, everyone. We'll uh, resume with the final two items on our calendar. Uh, let's call roll. Jimenez. Present. Perales. Here. Cohen. Here. Carrasco. Davis. Here. Esparza. Here. Arenas. Foley. Here. Mahan. Here. Jones. Present. Ricardo. Present. All right, thank you. Um, let's start with 8.2, which is the Affordable Housing Siting Policy Status Report. We have a presentation on this item. <clears throat> Welcome, Rachel and Jackie and Kevin and team. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, I am Josh Ishimatsu, uh, Housing Policy Team Manager, and today I'm tonight I'm joined with uh, joined by Jackie Morales Friend, uh, our Housing Department Director, Rachel Vanderveen, Deputy Director, and Kemet Mawakama, uh, Division Manager. Um, we are here today to bring back our recommendations related to the Affordable Housing Siting Policy, uh, the Siting Policy determines where city funding is prioritized for the construction of new affordable housing. Over a year ago, we discussed this policy, and since then, um, the policy in, we um, have worked to strengthen its effectiveness. We have heard the community and shaped the policy in a new way, um, ensuring we both expand opportunities for low-income families and continue to invest in neighborhoods throughout the city. This policy now presents the best of both worlds, incentivizes development of affordable housing in areas previously excluded, and uh, strategically invests in all other areas of the city. Um, next slide, please. So a big reason why we need the siding policy is about the history of racist policies in our past. Um, this map, this figure, is an infamous redlining map of the city of San Jose created by the Federally Chartered Homeowners Loan Corporation, or HOLC, in 1937, where racial and ethnic composition of neighborhoods um, were used to determine which neighborhoods were appropriate for housing investment, um, where red areas on the map, or red-lined areas, were quote-unquote hazardous or undesirable, and green areas were the most desirable for investment. For most big cities, you show the redlining map, and it is obvious a, obvious how past racist policies influence the landscape that we see today. Um, because the maps, even though they are over 80 years old, uh, still define what are quote unquote good neighborhoods and quote unquote bad neighborhoods. The racist patterns of investment and disinvestment are still evident. The legacy of racism and segregation are still evident. For San Jose, um, the story is a little bit more complicated it's a slightly different story, though it's still a story about racism and segregation. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is because the red line version of San Jose is only a small portion of um, the current city limits. So this map that we see here in the center, in the center of the map is the small, the small center, you know, the little square is the red line, is the red line map. It's, the, it's a smaller scale version of the same map that we saw before. Um, San Jose <laughs> grew through annexation and subdivision following World War II. From 1850 to 1980, San Jose added almost 200,000 housing units. Um, these three decades constitute a growth spurt that, that built the majority of the city. Um, it's a time when the majority of the city's housing stock was built. So it's a definitional period of time for the city in terms of our built environment. 
Um, it's why, for example, of all the big cities in the U U.S., we have one of the highest proportions of single-family housing, and why we have more than any other major American city, why we have more of our residential land dedicated to single-family uses. Um, and this growth spurt also happened during a time across the country when most big cities, including San Francisco and Oakland in the Bay Area, were losing population as white households moved from the central cities to the suburbs. Um, and this suburbanization, as documented in Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law, was explicitly racist and was enacted by and sort of supported by a whole host of institutions and actors, public and private, federal, state, and local, including, of course, by the city of San Jose. And um, the investment for suburbanization was massive. On top of all the mortgages for the housing, there was also new infrastructure, new roads, new schools, new, new utilities, waste treatment facilities, sewer lines, et cetera. In San Jose, it also meant land use and zoning changes, the annexation and legal subdivision of order, orchards and farmlands to create massive housing tracts outside of the central city. Uh, next slide, please. So in co contrast to this historic pattern of growth of the city outside the central core, affordable housing development has generally happened in the center of the city. So um, this map shows affordable so housing sites uh, represented by dots on the map. And there's a greater density of dots in the center of the map. Uh, and it's actually, you can't completely see it because there's dots on top of dots in the center. Uh, we also have older, well, we have an older central core, and which accounts for the majority of our affordable housing, and then some more clusters of housing in the center east of the map, and there are additional uh, clusters of housing along main transit lines, especially the light rail. And then, of course, there are lots of blank spots on the map. So generally, as we'll talk about more during the presentation, affordable housing has reinforced the patterns of investment and disinvestment in the city, where affordable housing um, has been developed in parts of the city that were already lower income and majority communities of color. And the parts of the city that have historically benefited from higher levels of investment, um, there has not been the same level of siting of affordable housing. So this is one big argument for why we need something like the siting policy. This is the history of our city. We grew through a whole com combination of racist and exclusionary practices and policies like restrictive covenants, discriminatory lending practices, exclusionary zoning policies. So the siting policy is an attempt to address this past history, an attempt to put more affordable housing in the neighborhoods which have historically excluded affordable housing. And I'll now uh, pass the presentation over to Jackie. <coughs> Thank you, Josh. Um, the siting policy applies to the location of new permanent deed restricted affordable housing, which is financed by the city of San Jose. This also includes acquisition and rehabilitation of newly affordable housing, and where the siting policy applies to our inclusionary housing program, which basically, when a development does an off-site, 100% clustered affordable housing development. I think it's important to understand that the siting policy is concerned with the experience of the residents of affordable housing and seeks to expand their choice to live in a wide range of San Jose neighborhoods. The siting policy does not apply to the temporary shelters, emergency interim housing, or to affordable homes created through the city's inclusionary housing ordinance. So that's when they're included within a market rate development. You can see here images of our affordable housing developments that have been funded by the city, and the siting policy would apply to these developments and would impact the residents who live in these developments. Next slide. The goals of the siting policy are threefold. First, to expand choice to low-income households by building affordable housing in neighborhoods where there are few deed-restricted apartments or where they have been excluded over time. This is consistent with both California and federal fair housing laws. Second, the policy will mitigate displacement by providing affordable homes for residents wanting to remain in their own neighborhoods, especially where we see gentrification beginning to happen. 
And third, the siting policy will be transparent to developers and easily administered by staff. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, during the housing element community outreach process, we heard from our resident, residents and community advocates a concern about the language used in the policy and its potential impact on neighborhoods. We reflected on the feedback and we examined the previously proposed language used to describe neighborhoods, the makeup of the communities, and the impacts of those results. We understand that words have power this awareness has brought staff to reflect, revise, and understand how labels such as distressed communities, struggling neighborhoods, high crime areas, or any such combination of deficit plus geography to describe neighborhoods impacted by racism, disinvestment, physical destruction, and economic exclusion are potentially harmful and may result in unintentional consequences. Even more concerning to us was that the labels used to describe these neighborhoods would then be attached to the people who live within them, further stigmatizing them. Such language reduces our communities to only their challenges while concealing the sy systemic forces that cause those challenges and the systemic solutions needed to combat them. I will now turn the presentation over to Rachel to who will go over the actual policy. Thank you, Jackie. All right, so tonight I'm going to provide an overview of our recommendations. We are recommending moving forward with an affordable housing siting policy that includes two neighborhood areas, the affordable housing expansion area and continued investment areas. On the map in front of you, you can see affordable housing expansion areas in the dark blue on the map. These areas are defined as census tracts scoring in the top 40% within the whole Bay Area based on an index of place-based factors, including access to jobs, strong educational outcomes, and high rankings on a environmental health rating scale. These maps are consistent with the maps used by the state to award both tax credits and multifamily housing revenue bonds. The second area indicated by light blue on the map are essentially the remainder of the city, which we are titling <coughs> continued investment areas. What we know is that if you calculate the percentage of population living in our city, 34% of residents live in affordable housing expansion areas, while 66% live in continued investment areas. At the same time, only 9% of affordable housing that has been built to date is located in affordable housing expansion areas. This number is reflected of patterns of exclusion within San Jose, while when you look, over 90% of all affordable housing has been built in our continued investment areas. The affordable housing siting policy establishes a goal of locating 35% of all new affordable homes in affordable housing expansion areas. This is the core goal of the siting policy. I do want to note that making change over time is challenging and slow. Based on modeling for future projections, after five years of placing 35% of all of our new housing in expansion areas, it will result in 12% of affordable homes in expansion areas over five year term. This is an increase from 9% to 12%. Staff is also recommending that proposed developments in specific areas will require further review prior to funding. These two criteria include, first, if the census track or the census block area has 50% or more of homes that are deed restricted affordable housing that exist already, or 
if the census tract has more than 20% of households living below the poverty threshold. In these cases, developments located in these areas identified as needing further review, staff will determine if these developments may move forward if, if they meet any one of the following four criteria. So first, if the neighborhood is identified as an area facing displacement. Second, if the site is located in a growth area. Third, the if the development is a mixed income development. Or fourth, the site is located in an area included in a funded community development investment plan. The siting policy will be evaluated on a five-year basis. The analysis will include all affordable housing, including developments that were not funded by the city. And now I will turn the presentation over to Kemet. Good evening. The staff recommendation evolved since last year. I want to take a moment to explain why these changes were made. First, the prior recommendations included a third neighborhood category that essentially limited housing choice in certain areas, while the new recommendation focuses, focuses on expanding choice. Second, the prior recommendation contributed to the negative stereotypes of affordable housing and unintentionally used language that harm low-income neighborhoods. However, the updated recommendations focus on investment in all parts of the city, including those areas where disinvestment has occurred over time. Third, the prior recommendation lacked consensus around the criteria used in the policy to define crime. While the new policy recommendation is based on income data consistent with the research, with research in federal policies. We would also like to bring forward a recommendation to invest not only affordable housing dollars, but also community development block grant funds, which provide investment in the, in the community, projects like street lights, community gardens, and library facilities that all come together to build a healthy and vibrant neighborhood. We are recommending that these funds be prioritized in areas that are defined by the Department of Housing and Urban Development as RECAP areas. RECAP is an acronym for racially or ethnically concentrated areas of poverty. This investment will help to reverse historic patterns of disinvestment that have occurred in San Jose. I want to note that we recognize that place-based strategies have limitations. In the coming year, staff will work with the community to identify solutions to find ways we can also address any underserved communities that are not direct beneficiaries of this place-based approach. I will now turn the presentation back to Jackie. Thank you. Thank you, Kemet. I would like to thank the entire team that worked over the past year and a half to develop our siting policy. I want to recognize Dan Rinsler from the California Housing Partnership, his colleagues at the Othering and Belonging Institute at Berkeley, Alicia St. Laurent, who kept our team on track. She organized our project and she facilitated many of our community meetings, Kristen Clements and Josh who's here with us tonight, who's working on our policy team and has provided extensive research and background, and Kemet, who has also provided more support in this area to the whole entire team. I also, more importantly, want to recognize the community members who stayed with us over the 18-month stretch, who also came back and told us to work harder, do more work, and help to reshape this important policy. This concludes our presentation, and we are available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, and uh, thank you, Kemet and Josh and Rachel and, and the entire team. Uh, I came into office oh, back in 2007, I guess, as a council member, and at the time, I think we had what was called a dispersion policy, and I just wanted to say what a vast improvement this is over what we had then, and I know this took a lot of work. I appreciate the product. Uh, let's go to the public. Matt King. Hey, good evening. This is Matt King with Sacred Heart Community Service, and tonight I'm representing Sacred Heart. 
as well as the Housing Justice Working Group of the Race Equity Action Leadership Coalition. We've, we've been talking with staff and have been able to meet with almost all of the offices, so I'll keep it short tonight. You've heard from us already. Uh, really want to appreciate the staff for the work they've done over the last many months and, and what they've brought you tonight and appreciate their focus on choice. Um, everyone deserves to have choice in where they live in our city and housing that everybody can afford is, I think it's the bedrock for creating resilient, self-sustaining and thriving communities and the starting point to righting the wrong of our painful racist past that is that we're still living with today to boil down what we like about the new proposed policy and why we urge you to adopt it it increases affordable housing funds to historically red kind red line communities that we're calling continued investment areas and it funds and incentivizes affordable housing in the historically exclusive communities that are called affordability expansion areas it locates affordable housing throughout the entire city and removes the crime and poverty statistics as a basis for building affordable housing and uses better inclusive language that abandons racially and class motivated divisive categories. Thank you. Paul Soto. <clears throat> yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. San Jose redlined the Mexicans, stripping him of ancestral wealth. Chicanos of my generation were burglarized, robbed, using force of law and fear of the policeman's club. From wealth we normally would inherit, had the Chicanos' right to private property been respected. Does not the Chicanos of my generation deserve equal protection under the law, due process, as we redress the historical injustices? San Jose stole from Chicanos, the security of stability in these uncertain times of gentrification and cultural paradigm shifts that is heavily promoted by Gary Dillabo, Jay Paul, Eric Hayden, Alex Shore, and anybody else that supports these men. Anybody else that advocates on this council on behalf of these men, and there's a few, in conclusion, it is my contention that the greatest acts of violence San Jose and Santa Clara County has done to Los Campesinos de Sasicuedes y Los Chicanos de Barrio Horseshoe is to deny us our humanity. And you deny my humanity if you deny me my history. And this city continues in, these, in the language that you're using to deny me that history. Barrio Horseshoe was D11. When you look on your map, it was the lowest resourced area ever. I'm sick and tired of Somos Mayfair and CC Puede Collective being consulted about what has happened in my barrio. We speak for ourselves. From the barrio comes the voice of the people. These nonprofits that keep corrupting the system, Somos doesn't speak for Barrio Horseshoe. CC Puede Collective doesn't speak for Barrio Horseshoe. I speak for my barrio because I know what it's like to grow up there. This housing. Uh, Kristen Clements. Kristen? Hi, I'm staff here to support this item. I do not have a comment. <laughs> <laughs> Gabrielle? Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Great. Uh, Gabrielle Hernandez, the director for the CISA Puede Collective. Um, again, thanking um, the housing department for responding to, you know, again, the uh, several different inquiries and letters where we were rejecting the redlining language and uh, appreciate the uh, changes um, to not stigmatize the neighborhoods and hoping that the city council will um, adopt this new uh, siting policy and hopefully um, in five years we'll be able to see, um, you know, how accountable we can hold the city to putting affordable housing throughout the, the neighborhoods in San Jose. Thank you. Steve Bankston. Steve Bankston. Good evening. 
My name is Steve Pinkston. I'm a resident in District 10 and a member of the Silicon Valley Interfaith Coalition. I urge you this evening to adopt the Housing Department staff's proposed revision to the affordable housing sitting policy. I believe it is essential to spread affordable housing throughout the city while not disinvesting from historically disenfranchised communities. How wonderful it would be if residents born in San Jose could afford housing in San Jose. I bought a home in San Jose 35 years ago and could not afford it today if I were, as a retired man, if I were looking for this same home today. My son, born in San Jose, needed to look outside in Morgan Hill to afford housing. Both he and his wife are professionals. He's an engineer. My daughter and her husband and their son, my grandson, live in housing subsidized by her employer. And that housing expires in a year and a half. Again, I say, how wonderful it would be if they, born in San Jose, could afford housing in San Jose and live in a, a wonderful, beautiful San Jose neighborhood. Thank you for considering my comments. Blessings to you. And as Jesus would say, as much as you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. Thank you. David Lowe. Good evening, Mayor and Council. David Lowe speaking on behalf of Destination Home to offer our support of the updated affordable housing siting policy. I really just want to thank staff for all of the extensive work they've done over the months to get us where we are today, which we think is a sound policy that will be really important for our efforts to address our affordable housing and homelessness uh, crisis. Um, as many of the speakers said, we're just really pleased to see that this siting policy recognizes the need to continue building throughout San Jose while taking those additional steps that will incentivize development in parts of the city where we just have not seen it traditionally be built. And we think this approach is important to meet all of our affordable housing needs as a community, and we hope you will pass it today. Thank you. Matthew Reed. Matthew. Yes, good evening, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, staff, Matthew Reed, Silicon Valley at home. Uh, I want to echo the appreciation that you've heard from the work that the housing department has undertaken to continue to reach out to community members, members of the affordable housing development community, broad range of stakeholders. We've been honored to sponsor some of these conversations and we feel like they were really positive and fruitful. Um, affordable housing is a community asset and it is needed in every community in San Jose. Affordable housing investments improve the quality of life in the communities where they're built and serve the interests of the city and its people. Decades of research have shown that affordable housing improves education achievement, job attainment, retention, mental and physical health, while decreasing family and neighborhood violence. We appreciate the housing department staff's commitment um, to supporting development in areas where we have historically built less and that this effort is being coordinated, we feel very effectively uh, with the planning department and we're actively working to leverage both land use and uh, policies to, to streamline tools to reduce barriers in some of these areas where we've struggled historically to build housing. But in achieving the intent of this policy is going to require sustained commitment from both the city staff and the elected offices of the mayor and the council members to be effective. Overcoming long established barriers requires both policy tools and political leadership. And we ask that your support for this policy today be lasting and signify a statement of this long-term commitment to creating an equitable city. Thank you. Blair. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot for this item. Um, the, the work that you've been doing on this issue, along with uh, 
civic innovation staff and what they're trying to address with the future of community technology. Uh, this is what I've been talking about in the past few weeks that I've been very impressed by overall. Uh, it seems, you know, affordable uh, housing siting issues six months a year ago was based more on concepts of the future of Google Village. And there was a certain uh, confusion about how to better address these issues that it seems like, uh, you know, with a really good uh, housing advocacy community, you've really worked on the issue and, and have come up with some uh, interesting good directions for the future of, of these issues. Thank you. You're talking about concepts of mixed income for the first time that I find hopeful and interesting. Good luck in those conversations. It's it's delicate, but yet it's really understandable uh, what what it's trying to work towards and accomplish for our future that I hope all parts of the community will, will want to uh, uh, listen and, 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 and add to uh, what can develop. Uh, I think it's a really interesting concept about sharing and caring for our future, that uh, it, it's not exclusive and it's learning to bridge things and uh, a whole community effort would be appreciated for, for its really important purposes that it has. So good luck in those efforts. Um, and, and thank you to, again to Rachel Vanderveen who has uh, spoken that, you know, extremely low income is only at about $35,000. So there's a lot of people and families living under that. How can we better start talking about those ideas and policies for the future of affordable housing? Thank you. Alex Schur. Hey, good evening, Council. Alex Schur. I got a chance to look at this uh, sitting on the Housing Commission, although I'm not speaking on behalf of the Commission tonight. And I think this policy has gotten much, much better. And I thank staff for their community engagement, for listening so intently and taking their positive intentions and turning them into improved policies. I think this is a lot better. I, I want to thank Regina Celestin Williams from SV at Home, formerly First Community Housing. I think she's had a lot of insight on this issue, on how we don't want to do redlining 2.0, and this policy goes a long way toward avoiding that. Also want to thank the Si Se Puede Collective and Gabriel for his work. And building off Matthew Reed's comments tonight, affordable housing is an asset. It's like having police stations in every neighborhood. It's like having firehouses in every district. It's like having libraries in every community. It is a benefit to all of us to have it throughout the city. And I'm so grateful that the council will be moving forward with this policy, hopefully tonight, to accomplish that. So thank you again to staff for all your work and for community advocates, including Sacred Heart Community Services for their work on this issue as well. Caller with last four digits, 7168. Hi, thanks. It's Carmen Bremer. I'm a resident of District 8, and I'm also a member of the Real Coalition and the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet. Lack of affordable housing is a system-made problem that must be fixed. To create just and equitable communities, our city should be working towards neighborhood parity where all citizens, especially those in historically redlined communities, have upward mobility. It's time for the city to move away from using crime and poverty data to define our neighborhoods. Much thanks to the staff for their engagement with the community and responsiveness to the concerns they raised. We support the recommended CED siting policy as it stands before you today. We have an exciting opportunity to create a policy that's innovative, effective, equitable, and values everyone in every neighborhood. Thank you. Jeremy Bruce. Good evening, Jeremy Bruce, Director of Policy and Organizing with Amigos de Guadalupe, Center for Justice and Empowerment, and we are a member of the Si Se Puede Collective. I urge the council to adopt the Housing Department's updated affordable housing siting policy, which moves away from defining neighborhoods by crime and poverty data and still accomplishes the spirit of the original policy. 
to incentivize affordable housing in San Jose neighborhoods that have been historically excluded affordable housing development and address the threats of gentrification, displacement, and neighborhood destabilization in communities that have been historically disenfranchising by ensuring that those communities have an adequate supply of affordable housing. This policy is one of the many tools to ensure that we continue to uplift our families, which is why we urge the council to adopt it tonight. Thank you. Melissa Shecklin. Hi, I'm Melissa. I'm a resident of Japantown District 3 and an employee of City of San Jose. So I came to this meeting through Racial Equity Action Leadership Coalition and just wanted to voice my support in adopting the Housing Department's proposed revisions to the affordable housing siting policy. It sounds like you've done a lot of work on this and have really taken things into, a, into account to move forward in a responsible manner. Um, you know, I chose to live in San Jose, and I believe that it wants to be a vibrant, equitable city. And I think that building housing, affordable housing, as much as we can throughout the city is the way to do that. Uh, thank you for engaging with the community on this issue and ask that you again make the, go ahead with this revision. Thank you. Caller with last four digits, 0319. Hi, good evening. My name is Tina Morrill. I am a neighbor in the Vendome neighborhood in District 3. And um, I'd like to say thank you very much um, to the Housing Department for, um, you know, all of the thought that they put into uh, this new policy. I do want to request, uh, I think it's very important that the community understands the type of quote unquote affordable housing that is going to go in. So for example, is it senior housing, supportive housing, affordable housing, or a combination thereof? Um, I think it's a fair request to be transparent with the community and tell us about the specific plans for housing. So I would like that request to please be considered. Thank you very much. Ali Sapperman. Hi, um, Ali Saferman, San Jose resident, also with Housing Action Coalition, going to keep this short because I've lost my voice. Um, but I think this is really great policy. I just want to echo previous comments. Please support this tonight. Thank you. Erin Neff. Hi, my name is Erin Neff. I'm the lead policy attorney for the housing program at the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. Um, our organization is one of the only organizations in San Jose that are representing people in eviction proceedings. And we see firsthand every day how people lose their homes and then get displaced from San Jose because there's no affordable homes for people uh, to move to and to live in. Um, I think that this policy is a drastically improved step uh, to building affordable housing in San Jose and addressing fair housing issues. I think it's important to note that under um, California state law, specifically AB 686, um, San Jose has a responsibility to affirmatively further fair housing. And under California Departments of Housing and Urban Development's published guidance on how to affirmatively further fair housing, they've noted that it's actually policing and criminalization that are contributing factors that cause segregation racial concentration, disparities in opportunities, and in disparities and opportunities for people with disabilities. So I think the amendments that the housing department has made to remove that language from the siting policy now puts it in compliance with state law and addresses the past harms that were outlined in the presentation um, that led to segregation and disparities and opportunities for people of color in San Jose. Um, so I wanna thank the housing department for all the great work that they've done on it. And I really encourage the city council to adopt the, this new housing siting policy that's removed the racist language about violence um, and statistics that had no benefit to the community. Thank you. Cam Coulter. Cam Coulter. Going on to the next speaker, Rachel Welch.
Rachel Welch. Okay, going on to the next speaker, Saratoga Area Senior Coordinating Council. Yes, hello, my name is Tyler Taylor, Executive Director for SASE and also founder and co-operator of the RIDE Senior Transportation Program, uh, also member of the Real Coalition. Older adults uh, have always faced difficulties remaining in the communities they live, uh, especially uh, communities of color. I'm very encouraged by the work that was done by staff and I strongly support uh, this going through. Thank you for this consideration and we look forward to seeing this come to life. Back to council. Great, thank you. Thanks to the members of the community uh, for coming out to speak. Councilman Perales. Uh, Councilman Perales, I'm sorry, you're muted right now. You can't hear me? Uh, we can barely hear you now. Oh, sorry, let me. There you go. Yeah. Okay, apologize. I'll speak louder. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much, uh, staff, for the, the presentation and the public speakers that came out. This work on the siting policy has been many years in the making, as the mayor pointed out, uh, once called the dispersion policy. As I came into office, uh, it, it very quickly became a topic of interest for me and for my community members. As I came in on a, a platform to champion affordable housing and, uh, and sought out to, to make good on that, uh, we started to, to approve a number of projects uh, and signing projects within District 3. And uh, time and again, we would see projects uh, either never make it to the council, uh, or if, if there was a, a, a council discussion, uh, we saw a lot of opposition and, and even at times from my council colleagues um, throughout the years on projects within their district. And I got a lot of frustration from community members in District 3 that felt as though uh, you know, we were doing our part per se in District 3 and that we weren't really seeing affordable housing being cited or developed, approved at least and developed in other parts of the city. And as uh, we started to, to uh, hear more about the, the historical and, and uh, more immediate data that showed uh, the, the relevance uh, of that sentiment, where in fact, there are parts of uh, our city that, that have zero uh, affordable housing, uh, you know, for, for blocks and miles to come and, um, and even districts. Um, and, and we saw the, the realities of historic redlining and ultimately of a very weak dispersion policy that we had here in the city. Fortunately, we had the state mandate to actually look at how we are more equitably citing uh, affordable housing and creating opportunities throughout our entire city. And so around the same time as, as I was very interested in that work, the city um, was tasked to be able to move forward with that work. Uh, it, it has taken quite some time and as staff pointed out, gone through a number of iterations. Um, I don't know, uh, right, if, if you ever can reach perfect. Um, I do think that the policy is better uh, today than than what it was at the start and uh, and appreciate everybody and all the stakeholders that participated to get where it is uh, but really the uh, only time will tell uh, and and the reality is is that uh, we need to be able to approve uh, or well, I guess it'll start with you know a, a funding right so funding and approving and then ultimately developing affordable housing all throughout our city and predominantly in these expansion areas as uh, staff has highlighted in areas that uh, we know have, have really been uh, untouchable and in areas that, that we know uh, that could bring great benefit to the entire community. And, um, and so that's my hope that we actually will see some, um, some great dispersion and some more equitable dispersion and we'll see opportunities created for people of all incomes to live all over our city and, uh, and be able to, to chip away at the historic redlining uh, and the historical uh, communities that were off limits to people of color and to low-income individuals. And uh, that's, a, that's a hope of mine. I do hope that this policy is going to help us get there at the same time, ensuring that we're not embracing gentrification of particular parts of our community and continuing to create opportunities all over the city. Uh, that's always been the, the interest of mine 
And so uh, I'll, I'll end my comments there, but I appreciate uh, the work and I will move the uh, staff recommendation. Second. And All right, uh, Councilmember Foley. <clears throat> thank you. I want to uh, thank staff. Mayor, I have my hand up. Yes, yeah, so we'll be right with you, Councilmember as far as the Councilmember Foley had her hand up and she's here. Uh, Councilman Masparza, I'll be I'll be brief. Thank you to staff for your presentation. Uh, I saw it at CED, but I also had a briefing from you, and the briefing was very informative for me and my staff. I really appreciate that, and I also appreciate the attention to changing words in the from the original siting policy, high resourced area, etc., to the new. Uh, language i think words does matter and changing the to the just making the two categories is really important and uh making them the affordable housing expansion areas and then the con continued development areas is really important i i i've said this before that uh uh, I'm a supporter of affordable housing and we have a lot of projects coming into District 9 and that's a good thing. It, it does need to, we do need to make sure that we have affordable housing accessible by all, all over the city of San Jose and we're seeing that happening and while there, every day I get a proposal from a different affordable housing developer, Someday they're all going to come through, uh, and they are one by one, little little by little, and and it's exciting to see it happen, and eventually see them uh, get built and have residents who are sometimes neighbors already who cannot afford to live in a, in the city, but now they can with the affordable housing that we're building, and so this this is a good thing. I I the siting policy is uh, it. I appreciate how much you listened to the community and you worked with them to make it right for everybody involved. So I look forward to seeing all this development occur around the city and particularly in my district. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Sparza. Thank you, Mayor. And um happy to follow those remarks by Councilmember Foley and uh, thankful for her uh, her leadership um, in really having uh, equitable development in District 9. Um, you know, this is really about two things. This is about opening up parts of the city that have been, frankly, closed to affordable housing. There are parts of the city that have zero extremely low-income units in them. And, and, and the other part, is really um, communities like mine um, that have been neglected and disinvested for decades. Um, when the council originally adopted our affordable housing dispersion policy in the late 80s, thanks to the leadership of then council member Banca Alvarado, the goal of the policy was to ensure that affordable housing was equitably distributed throughout the city. That was over 30 years ago. The policy was put on pause during the Great Recession. And, and to be blunt, we as a city have failed to ensure equitable distribution. Um, concentrating affordable housing, particularly extremely low income and permanent supportive housing in under-resourced communities, which has really perpetuated segregation and these historical inequities. And this is exactly what Blanca Alvarado fought so hard to avert. And so when the housing department brought this policy to the council in 2021, we raised a lot of questions and a lot of concerns about how the proposed categories were defined because they suggested that many of our very disparate communities, uh, for example, communities around the Rose Garden and Santee, Santee, one of the poorest neighborhoods in the city, the only community in the city with a housing and public safety injunction, belonged in the same category with the Rose Garden. And so consequently, the council voted unanimously to ask staff to revisit those categories with the intention of developing a map that more accurately reflects the realities 
on the ground. So I'm a little disappointed because instead of developing a map that accurately reflects those real experiences of residents living in neighborhoods like Santee and others, or a policy that differentiates between the types of affordable housing um, so that extremely low income housing doesn't continue to be concentrated in certain areas um, and housing for teachers um, and police officers gets concentrated in other areas of the city instead of really focusing on that mixed approach and opening up parts of the city. We see a policy that allows for the continued concentration of affordable housing in underserved communities without a phase in approach. And so I bring this up because I represent the district with the most extremely low income units, the second most affordable units overall after district three, and the least number of market rate units in the city, leaving less funding for schools, for parks, even, even public art. And so um, districts three, six, and seven are head and shoulders above every other council district in the city when it comes to affordable housing units of every type. Half of the districts in San Jose, half of our city host combined less than 10% of all affordable housing. And so going back to the two things, neighborhoods, other neighborhoods need a chance to overcome those years of neglect. I'll give you a couple of examples. The area around the fairgrounds, which years ago gave up 14 acres to build affordable housing um, and, and a clinic. We just partnered with San Jose State and the county to get state funding to open up a track and field and an amazing center um, there community wants it because they have no park. There's no park anywhere around. We've built so many units all over the place, not one park in the area. The nearest library is the Tully Library or Seven Trees Library. They're like in between. Um, and that's who knows how many years, hopefully San Jose State's very eager to move on that. Um, so hopefully it won't be too long before that community has a simple amenity like a park. Another part uh, of the community, Tropicana Lanai, have fought for over eight years to build a park, one of the most densest census tracts in the city. And over eight years it took to build a pocket park on a patch of dirt next to a sound, sound wall, a freeway sound wall. And so this is one example. District seven has the busiest fire station, not just in the city, but amongst the busiest in the state. And so when we look at the quality of life, how things are funded, how we bring investments into areas that have been disinvested for a long time, because our schools get less money than even the West side or other cities as Councilmember Carrasco has so often brought up, we get a fraction of it. We have to beg for after school program funding or tutoring programs and services to help our families. And so, so that's the part of it. Um, you know, the, what I'm struggle with is that this is a beginning to me that we open up areas of opportunity in the city that has been closed, instead of continuing to do what we've always done, which is we concentrate the poor people in the city in certain neighborhoods. Not only do we do that, but then we don't provide them amenities or services or programs. And they're already starting with less, that even just adding one little thing is a drop in the bucket compared to the decades that neighborhoods have been behind. 
And, and so I'm, I seconded the motion because I don't want another dozen years to go by without a side, uh, without a siding policy, dispersion policy, siding policy. Um, because in the years, in the dozen years that we have it, communities have been further and further disenfranchised. And so to me, this policy before us, it's a start. And I call on all the callers, all the letters, all the meetings, that when there's a proposal to build extremely low income housing in a part of the city that has zero, that you come out to support that. Um, I have a question for the city manager. Um, you know, part of this policy calls for adding investment, um, investments like infrastructure programs and services to areas that have been less resourced. How is the city manager's office going to align that funding with the goals of this siting policy? Um, thank you for your question. I'm going to actually turn it over to Lee Wilcox, Assistant City Manager, and Rosalind Huey, Deputy City Manager. But they'll tell you more, but it's going to be in, as, as Jackie had shown in the presentation, some of our CDBG investments and also in how we uh, embed our racial equity considerations into our work and, and, and as we're doing that in our budget considerations. But I'll let them tell you a little bit more. Yeah, sure. and thank you. Before before they do that, CDBG is is and, and so for example, Center Road, right? Um, when we look at infrastructure, um, we got ten million dollars from the state, which is super awesome and makes that project real. But it's a twenty million dollar project, right? Um, so so uh, I'm a CDBG is kind of a drop in the bucket, yeah. and I'm really interested in. Um, how we build the racial equity in the city's overall budget when it comes to libraries, yep. um, community centers, uh, programs and services, um, and absolutely. the like. Thank and, you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we know our resources are scarce, and we've got to be really wise in our investments. But, uh, Lee, are you going to yeah. Yeah, go dive in a little bit more? I'll go ahead and start. And thank you for the question, uh, Council Member Esparza. Lee Wilcox, Assistant City Manager. I'll start, and then uh, Rosalind can finish us up here. Uh, I, I would agree that the funding source that we're talking about at this point in time is is a drop in a bucket. Um, and so, you know, housing department, I've obviously been working closely with the city manager's office on this budget and our intergovernmental relations team. And I think um, like a lot of other cities are doing, we do need to maximize existing federal and state resources as we move these programs forward. That's gonna be critically important. You know, and then I, I'd like to say, I think there's there's two different avenues for us. One is, as we go ahead and add services through the budget process, one of the things, you know, that Jennifer has set very clearly for this organization is that we're using our racial equity impact assessment um, as we go into the budget process and then adding the, the racial equity lens and then using the results based accountability through the budget process that we've been doing the last few years. And so all city employees have been trained, um, have started to be trained in these tools. So as we look at additional resources that we have the data, we're asking the set of questions that you're asking around what new services are we adding and where do they go, who are they gonna affect and where is their need? I would say secondarily as well, as we continue to step into this, um, there's current service delivery, and there's an assessment on current service delivery every year, every day, every week by departments that are looking at this, and it's our expectation, you know, in the city manager's office, the departments are continuing to use these tools to ask those questions as well as we augment services for some of these communities um, because there are different needs throughout different areas of the city, as you have just said. I, I think you, you just said there's areas where there's... Uh, services that are wanted and other areas where there's city there are services that are needed and we absolutely agree so i think that's where we're going to continue through the training and through the impact assessment and equity lens to ask ourselves these questions and when we do have resources available that we're able to uh, make recommendations to you on where they go and where there's holes but also just current service delivery where we need to augment and change existing programs units and service delivery we can use these tools to, to bridge that gap as well. 
Thank, thank you. you, Rosalind Huey, Deputy City Manager. I think the only thing I would add to that, Councilmember Sparza, is that we do have the opportunity to leverage um, items that are more long-term investments and long-term strategies. Um, I, I'm thinking of neighborhood um, planning processes that we undertake. Uh, many thanks to you, Councilmember Sparza and Councilmember Jimenez for your work along the Monterey Corridor. Um, the planning department has spearheaded um, a planning effort around the Capitol uh, Caltrain station area. And so we have opportunity to leverage those longer term investments, not just with the planning process, but with the longer term transportation and other infrastructure investments um, that we have in the area. So I think it's gonna take a combination of both, as Lee uh, mentioned, shorter term service delivery and how we approach that leveraging existing CDBG funding, uh, and then also leveraging our longer term investment opportunities. Thank you, appreciate it. That's it for me. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I also wanna thank you for uh, the, the briefing. It was, it was very helpful. Um, and, and this came up in the briefing, Jackie, and I just wanna just, you know, have a public conversation about it. Um, you, you and your team have done some extensive work. You've developed a strategy. Uh, so my first question is, um, how long, and, and I know this is a very difficult question to answer, but how much time do you need to fully implement the strategy to where we can see you know, the, the results and the, and the fruits of the, your efforts and the efforts of your team? So it is going to be incremental. Um, as part of this exercise, when we decided to look to see if we funded affordable housing development uh, under this policy that after five years, given the projections of how much money we believe we will have, we would move the needle from 9% of the affordable housing being in these expansion areas to 12% um, of the housing being these in, in these expansion areas. And so it's going to be incremental and slow which is why we wanted to come back in five years, which you know I think um, responds to council member Esparza's concerns regarding how do you hold yourselves accountable for actually moving the needle on ensuring that we're getting into these high opportunity areas that we report back in five years, how did we do? And were the strategies that we used, were they effective at all? Could we even achieve the first um, target, which was uh, the 35% of the units being in these areas. And, and then we want to ask the council, is that aggressive enough? Should we continue to do more? And we will look at the city to see how it's changed in five years in order to provide more data and, and information on that choice. Okay. So on any given uh, Tuesday, um, sometimes we as council members uh, have really great ideas and new suggestions and and changes to your um, to your strategy. Uh, how detrimental is that in terms of achieving your goals? And detrimental is it's, it's, that's a strong term, but <laughs> well, I mean, I think we have. The affordable housing, I think, right now is very straightforward. We have a release of uh, funding and developers apply for that. And so I don't think right now that the council has created anything that is changing this or would distract us from meeting this particular goal. And if it would, if it, if you were to do that, we would make it clear how that would impact our ability to continue to drive these numbers. Okay. Yeah, and, and as we talked about, Jackie, you know, the reason why I'm asking these questions is my concern that, you know, at least over the course of my eight years on council, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of the good work that you and your team have, have done, you know, creating these strategies and are not giving you an opportunity to actually fully implement those strategies before we start to make changes and adjustments. And it takes years 
to really see the impact of these strategies before you can even consider making changes. And I'm going to be gone, but you know, for future councils, I just want them to be aware, and, and hopefully you reinforce this, that you need the space and the opportunity to implement those strategies, see how effective they are, and then at the end of a certain you know, extended period of time, that's when you make the adjustments. And that, that's my concern, and that's why I was asking you those questions. And then um, my other question is, um, I know for a fact that, at least on my side of the city, uh, we welcome and we're looking forward to having more affordable housing projects. But you have that, uh, the issue in terms of, of land costs and being more expensive to develop on the west side. Um, implementing your strategy and knowing that the cost structure uh, on the west side is more expensive and you can't offset that with higher rents because it is affordable housing. What is the, the, the strategy in, in terms of addressing that, that, that cost differential? Actually, when we looked at this a little over a year ago, the cost, um, the cost was not that much different across the city. And right now, when we're seeing that, frankly, market rate housing is, is struggling to move forward, it really provides a huge opportunity for the affordable developers to move forward. Uh, the, the limiting factor on our side are tax credits. There aren't enough to go around with the pipeline that exists in the Bay Area. And we are certainly working with our partners uh, both in the county and in Destination Home to try to figure out ways in which we can uh, leverage other resources so that we can continue to invest in affordable housing. But I think right now there's huge opportunity for affordable housing because market rate is stuck. Okay. That, th thank you for that clarification. You know what happens when you assume, and I assumed it was more expensive, but good to hear that it's not. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, team. That's it, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. <clears throat> okay, uh, any additional questions or comments from my colleagues? If not, uh, we have a motion, I think, from Councilman Prowls. Is that right? Okay, let's vote on that motion. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Uh, aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's return now to the final item on our agenda. And, and thank you all. Uh, thank you for all the great work. Now the real work. We have to build it. Um, okay. Item, uh, item 8.3 and 8.4 we're going to take together. 8.3 is the amendment to Title 20 uh, regarding parking and transportation demand management policy. And 8.4 is uh, Council Policy 5.1, Transportation Analysis for Affordable Housing Projects. And I appreciate everyone's patience, including, or I should say everybody's patience, including staff, uh, for deferring this item to the evening when we understand there were uh, members of the public who wanted to speak. So welcome. Chris and Michael and team. We'll begin with a staff presentation and then we'll go to members of the community. Good evening, council and mayor. Happy to be here. My name is Martina Davis and I'm the division manager for our citywide planning group in PDCE. And I'm gonna kick us off on these two items. So today we're returning to council with two items that shape how we regulate development. These have been a joint effort between planning and the Department of Transportation in partnership with many other colleagues across the city, including housing, economic development, the attorney's office, and public works. Come on. There we go. First item tonight um, is 8.3 changes to the zoning ordinance to remove mandatory minimum parking requirements and revise the city's transportation demand management requirements for private development. 
The second item, 8.4, Amends Council Policy 5-1, which is the city's transportation analysis policy, including how we measure transportation impacts under CEQA using the vehicle miles traveled metric. Oh yeah, numbers change from this presentation, so it is 8.3 and 8.4 tonight. So why are we doing this? Um, these items today are a crucial part of our work to implement the general plan and the city's climate smart goals, to allow developments to right size their parking to meet market demand instead of providing parking based on requirements that have been largely unupdated since 1965, to make housing and especially affordable housing easier to build, and to activate underutilized spaces and support small businesses. All of this work has been analyzed with the recent cost development findings at top of mind. So since January 2020 on item 8.3, we've engaged with numerous community members and subject matter experts in a number of forums. Um, this has helped craft this proposal and the input we have received has been extremely valuable to us. You can see kind of all of the different things we've done here on this slide. Now, if this sounds familiar, it is because we have been here before with this uh, similar or same item. Um, back in June, we asked for direction from council regarding the final ordinance we should be bringing here tonight. As directed, the zoning ordinance update eliminates mandatory minimum parking requirements citywide with some exceptions. Namely, we are proposing to retain a minimal parking requirement around the Deeradon area for commercial development, which will help us meet our obligations with the SAP Center and to encourage shared parking in this area. This proposal also includes revised transportation demand management requirements that are clear, transparent, cost-effective, flexible, and equitable, with one menu of TDM requirements for all projects, so this should really provide some streamlining. Last but not least, we have addressed specific requests stemming from memos received in June, as well as including provisions that support continuation of the Alfresco program, allowing outdoor dining areas um, in areas that were previously reserved for parking. Regarding Alfresco, we have reviewed and are in support of the mayor's memo recommending that we continue work to provide greater flexibility for these outdoor spaces in the permitting process. So in closing on item 8.3, as mentioned earlier, cost of development findings you heard last month were at the top of our mind. Um, in general, both items before you are explicitly intended to streamline our process and reduce or hold neutral the cost of development. The one exception in some cases is TDM requirements, which depending on the context of, on the particular project may go down, may stay the same, or may go up slightly. Some projects today, for example, are required to do TDM requirements to receive a reduced parking um, allowance. So in that instance, it's an example of a project where we would expect to actually see lower costs under this proposal as reducing parking itself is a TDM measure and any remaining TDM requirements would be very minimal for these projects, so they should see a net cost reduction. There are some projects today that don't have to provide TDM. Um, and would need to implement that under the updated ordinance. Implementing TDM measures really are a fraction of providing parking, and we've worked to right size and adjust the TDM requirements to address some of the concerns on cost. So for example, um, we, our original proposal, we were targeting a 30 point of TDM measures, and looking at that cost figures and some other technicalities in there, we actually went ahead and reduced our proposal to 25 to try to take care of some cost. So in summary on item 8.3, we believe this ordinance strikes the right balance of streamlining development while also improving transportation options, reducing congestion and GHG emissions, and maintaining or enhancing the quality of life as the city grows. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleagues to talk about item 8.4. Evening Mayor and Council, Ramses Madhu, Division Manager, uh, Department of Transportation. Um, We've been working hard with our colleagues in many departments to update Council Policy 5-1. A real quick refresher for everyone, um, Council 5-1 was adopted back in 2018, um, and it was our uh, city's response to state requirements from SB 743 um, that changed CEQA rules, um, uh, removing level of service uh, measurements and replacing them with vehicle miles traveled. Um, 
uh, and this uh, move really focuses on infill development, particularly near transit, um, and uh, allows us to think at a regional level uh, when we're looking at uh, impacts uh, from transportation or on transportation from development. Um, when we uh, passed that original version, um, there was a, a clause in there, uh, a direction from council to come back after a few years once we got enough experience under our belt and the rest of the state uh, came into compliance uh, to come back with uh, any updates we felt were necessary uh, to make sure this uh, policy was helping us implement the general plan. Um, as we looked through um, the policy um, and had discussions with council offices um, and uh, other folks in the city um, realized um, that the housing um, interaction of this policy could use some uh, some improvement. Um, and so we have uh, two housing focused updates um, and then some technical updates that we are uh, bringing to you tonight. Um, we'll walk through these in slight in slightly more detail um, and then uh, there's a particular element um, to do with general plan amendments that we're going to go into deeper detail on tonight. Um, we're going to start with uh, market rate housing. Um, so under uh, the policy, there are three ways to get through uh, a SUCA analysis for transportation. One is to uh, get what we call a, uh, a streamlined process. Um, the words are skipping me. Um, that allows you to say, based on uh, surface level information, you can get um, a, a presumption of, of basically innocence to move through. Currently, these are the types of projects that get that um, uh, that presumption screened out. Thank you, Michael. Um, yes, they get screened out, right? And so this is small infill, uh, uh, neighborhood retail, things like this. And we have these two highlighted here, and these are the two that we're changing um, that are gonna help enable uh, more uh, housing in the city. So the first one here, um, you can see the, the highlighted piece from the last uh, slide is here with the, uh, um, the element that we're crossing out. We're gonna remove this with low VMT element from this, this statement, right? And so what this does is you can see the green areas uh, on the current map and then the green areas on the, uh, on the, the proposed map. Um, these are the areas in the city where if projects meet um, uh, certain specifications and projects, basically meaning that they are uh, uh, transit supportive, um, and uh, they will get this, uh, this screened out uh, approach, and it, uh, this greatly increases uh, or decreases, sorry, the uh, time that the CEQA analysis could take. Now, we're doing something even more uh, uh, um, drastic, and this is really great that we followed uh, item uh, 8.2, right? We're talking about getting more affordable housing in the city. How do we open the door for that kind of housing? This policy change is a great boost to housing production in the city, particularly affordable housing. What we've done is removed the requirement that housing, uh, affordable housing needs to be in planned growth areas and moved us from roughly 15% of the city to just over 60% of the city where affordable housing projects would be able to move more quickly through the development review process in the city. Uh, we're very happy with this and, and um, it, you know, anyways, this is a really great change um, if we're trying to get more affordable housing and more housing in general through this policy. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass over to Michael. Michael Brio, um, Deputy Director of Citywide Planning. So the question um, that I think we're gonna talk about tonight a bit is the issue of when a project can get an override, a statement of overriding considerations as part of the CEQA process. Just a reminder, when there's a, uh, a significant impact that can't be mitigated, um, for a project to move forward, council does have um, the ability to uh, do a statement of overriding considerations, weighing other factors that outweigh the, the environmental um, issue or impact that was identified and that, that um, project can therefore, the CEQA can be certified and the project can therefore move forward. Oops. Yeah, which button? So just kind of uh, to make it really clear, um, the way the policy currently is, not as currently is, as of now and has been since 2018 is that there are override opportunities for deed restricted affordable housing, market rate housing located within urban villages, commercial projects, industrial projects. What staff is recommending is adding additional um, support for an override within the policy for um, 
for market rate projects on land proposed with a housing general plan designation. Um, these are projects that would not need a general plan amendment, but have a general plan amendment that allows housing. And there was a bit of inconsistency between the policy, which says you couldn't, shouldn't do an override, and the general plan that says you can do housing. So we, we're correcting that inconsistency. And again, commercial and industrial projects, of course, could do an override. Um, I just want to note that the alternative recommendation, which we'll talk about tonight, it would be allow for an additional override for market rate housing that's proposed on private recreation land designated in the general plan um, within the urban growth boundary in the USA um, that is in those red and mitigable areas where there's nothing that you, you could do to mitigate or reduce the amount of driving that would occur in those outlying areas. So um, just stepping back even further, um, the alternative recommendation is here before you tonight uh, at the direction of T&E. Um, staff prepared what you're going to see tonight, and it was motion moved forward by the uh, t &E committee to bring to council. So um, the proposed criteria, the first question that we looked at is what was the locations that this, this new uh, override could um, be applied to, and we recommended it be lands within the urban growth boundary and the urban service area. We, d we don't want to um, facilitate, the general plan does not want to facilitate development outside of those areas. Um, and then looking at uh, what we came out down to was really just land designated private recreation. There, We did look at other uh, types of land on the edge of the city in these red VMT areas and in mitigable areas, and we didn't the general plan really wouldn't support, for example, putting, well, one thing I should say, there wasn't many properties that would really we'd anticipate redevelopment because most of the properties have been subdivided. Where there were a few, it was in lands designated lower hillside or rural residential, which we didn't think was appropriate um, for higher densities in those areas. Of course, council could have other, think otherwise on that down the road, but that's the, the position we took and T&E agreed with us on that. Um, so where we ended up is lands designated uh, private recreation. So I'm going to quickly run through the criteria that's in the alternative recommendation. First criteria is regarding affordable housing um, that for an override to occur, the, count, the project should make a, a significant contribution towards meeting the city's housing element, RENA goals for low and moderate income units. Um, there are commercial requirements if it's a greater than 25 acre property and the, the, the amount of commercial goes up depending on the size of the site. Um, this is not significant commercial, it's more place making, neighborhood serving type of commercial uses. Um, and then a project would like have to mitigate to the fullest extent possible that's VMT impacts. This is standard what, what we do now and what we're proposing to do, so this is really nothing that would be new. Um, and then in terms of parks, in, in the criteria is that in park division areas that a project should provide parkland in excess of PDO, PIO requirements. Um, and then other improvements that a project would be quite required to use recycled water if recycled water is available to the site. Uh, in terms of process, the alternative recommendation um, recommends considering um, that the project could be of a project of significant community interest under the public outreach policy. Um, outreach should be conducted throughout the entitlement process and conducted in the pro predominant language of the area. In terms of fiscal analysis, a project would be required to, um, or the applicant would be required to fund a fiscal analysis to identify fiscal impacts of the city, both positive and negative, where they would occur. Um, that that, uh, that uh, consultant would be managed by the city staff. Uh, entitlement process, process uh, staff recommend, or the criteria that, that um, t and &E is bringing forward recommends that a general plan amendment be submitted with, or a project be submitted with a general plan amendment, so there's full understanding of what the council would approve through the general plan amendment. There could be much more of a dialogue about what that project should look like with the community and other stakeholders. Um, staff are, are not recommending the alternative recommendation. Um, again, we this recommendation would facilitate development that's inconsistent with the general plan and climate smart San Jose. Um, we really believe um, that you know this discussion has really been driven by interest in one property, um, and we think it's, it, there should be a much broader conversation. Um, 
and you know, council has already uh, identified growth areas for uh, th throughout the city for growth, and we really think. Well, let me just say that the real issue here, I think, is is about the process um, to have a discussion about the redevelopment of these private recreation properties. So, is it going to be a city-driven process? or is it going to be a developer-driven process? We believe it should be a city-driven process because you can have a broader conversation about what the city's needs are, what the amenities can be included, and you can plan for a site within the larger context of the area. In the case of Pleasant Hill Golf Course, for example, you could be planning for that site in the context of likely future redevelopment opportunities in the area, including the anticipated closure and possible redevelopment of Retail View Airport and potential new development on the East Ridge Mall. And we think it's important to have a, a, that larger conversation um, being driven by the city, as opposed to driven by a, a private applicant who's really focused much more on the, um, what they intend to do with the given site. The Planning Commission recommendation, I think you're all aware of this, they recommended approve staff's recommendation uh, and reject the alternative recommendation. I do want to highlight a few things. Um, actually, I do want to first acknowledge uh, the three memos that were written. I'll, I'll start with um, the memo from Sergio Jimenez um, that talked about um, that this alternative criteria should not apply to land in Coyote Valley. Um, in reviewing that memo, it became clear that there was, uh, there was a specific uh, locational criteria that was not included in the 5-1 red line that was submitted um, the first time around so that, that that has been updated and it's in your packet tonight. Um, and the additional uh, language, um, hang on, let me go back. It's probably hard to see, but what it basically says, it says that this, um, this override, the alternative recommendation override would only apply to land that's designated private rec within the urban growth boundary and the urban service area. So that's been added. Um, I just wanna note that, of course, because of that criteria, it would not apply to areas in Coyote Valley or outside of the urban growth boundary. This is actually a map of where it would apply. These are the private recreation um, sites located in that immitigable red VMT area in San Jose. And as you can see, most of them are, are golf courses um, on the edge of the city. There are a few athletic clubs as well. Um, oh, it's hard to see this too. I do wanna note that there was additional language added um, as part of the review by the attorneys. We talked about this. I just wanna note, highlight this just to make sure that council uh, agrees with it and it says what the existing language is that the criteria is such applications shall demonstrate that the project will make significant contributions to solving the housing and further achievement of the city's below market rate housing needs allocation rena goal by per, by providing a significant amount of affordable housing to both low and moderate income house, households the addition is that units must be constructed on site and integrated within the development. So that, that was added. I just want to highlight that if council agrees with that or, or does not, we can move forward accordingly. Um, I also want to acknowledge the memo from um, Dev Davis and uh, council member Perales. Um, staff does agree with recommendation number three that a uh, general plan amendment should be uh, include a project for concurrent processing. And finally, I do want to acknowledge the memo from the mayor. Of course, as the mayor stated in his memo, we also support a city-led process. Um, I think we also agree with a recommendation too. We really support, believe there should be more clarity on the amount of affordable. Um, if not tonight, of course, as part of a, uh, a public engagement process, I think that really needs to be nailed down. I just want to note that, you know, the city is, is, um, had, has been successful in meeting its market road market rate goal for building a market rate housing. Where we're really, really struggling is in building moderate income housing and lower income housing. So we believe it's really important that we move forward with those and provide some clarity on, on the amount of housing that would be expected at some point in this process for the redevelopment of pri properties designated private recreation. Uh, and that concludes staff recommendation.
Great, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Ramses, Martina, everybody who worked on the, on this. Um, <clears throat> let's go to the public. Just to confirm, are we hearing items 8.3 and 8.4 together? Uh, hmm. Let's let's see here. Let's do that. Um, yeah, I think it's gonna be hard for us to split them apart at this point. So why don't we uh, hear them together? Okay, I'm Great. going to call Thank the in-person speakers first. If you can just, once your name's called, if you can make your way down. And when you come to the microphone, just introduce your name first. Uh, Marco Hernandez, Fred Buzo, Blair, and Juan. And whoever comes down first, you can go ahead and come to the mic. Good evening to everyone. My name is Marco Hernandez, and I'm president and business owner of the neighborhood of this tree. Um, we own Marisco's Costa Alegre location in San Jose, California, and we employ almost 100 people in San Jose. I am support of continuing of support of the city alfresco program, and especially outdoor dining in parking lots. It has been important to me because I was able to survive to the pandemic, and I was able to uh, create more jobs opportunities and also revenue. And it has been one of the most best things to support us through the pandemic. I ask the city council mayors, city staff, to make sure business are included in the future plans and policy for the Alfresco program. The changes today uh, will require business that are within 150 feet of housing, limit music and seating, mean that we might have a long road to be in compliance. We have invested a lot of time and, effort and, time and resources into our outdoor dining and ask the city and the staff equally value or efforts to take uh, our concerns into account. Thank you for listening. Hello, uh, Fred Buzo, San Jose Director uh, for SPUR, uh, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor Jones, uh, City Council, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak on this, on this uh, important item. Uh, first of all, SPUR is completely supportive of updates to the parking ordinance and also the transit demand uh, program and so uh, not here to speak on that particular part of the of 5.3 but uh, on the update to the uh, outdoor dining aspect of it and so one thing is I think we need to remember that we are not completely out of the pandemic um, uh, even the current Santa Clara County Health Order indicates still recommends that folks wear masks indoors when they're sharing space with others and as we see in San Jose we take mask wearing very seriously we see it all over our city and so what what by providing further flexibility for uh, businesses to engage in outdoor dining and parking lots, what that does is it provides them the opportunity to adapt so that their customers who don't, still don't feel comfortable eating inside can have, eat outdoors. And what that's resulted in is, one, as, uh, Mr., uh, uh, as, as Marco just stated, it provided a lifeline for businesses, and it continues to do so. And, so, and number three, what it does is it creates vibrancy within neighborhoods that we never thought we would see before. I can tell you, you know, and these are places that I've experienced personally from Bill of Fair in District 1 to Adelitas in District 9 to Luna Kitchen in, in District 6. It just created this vibe that I had never seen before in some neighborhoods. I live in District 9 and I can tell you, I had never seen so many people eating outdoors as I have in the past year and a half, two years. And so we would love that type of activity to continue. And we appreciate the mayor, uh, your, your memo, in uh, calling for some additional work to be done and creating a more flexible program for small businesses. Uh, and appreciate the staff's work and really getting it 75% there. And so um, hope that uh, you support staff recommendation with the uh, mayor's memo. Thank you. I'm going to call down Mark as well, if you can please line up. Hi, Blair Beekman here. I'm gonna use my mask uh, at this time. Uh, thanks a lot for these items. Uh, thank you that you're trying to work through the concepts of uh, market rate housing. And uh, what I think we're trying to learn how to talk about uh, you know, more specific ideas of housing now and, and how to talk about the different levels of housing. Uh, good luck in those attempts. Uh, middle income housing is a real important concept for our future, I think, in the future of transit centers. And uh, middle income housing can be kind of our, our, our higher end teacher salaries. And uh, 
That, that's an important concept for the future of uh, transportation centers. That uh, good luck how we talk about these 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 issues. It's important. We it sounds like you're learning to develop a little niche for market rate housing subjects, and then to really get into the focus of. Uh, I mean, there's a bunch of levels of, of housing and, and affordable housing that we have to learn how to better talk about. That's uh, good luck how we do that in the upcoming decade. With 50 seconds left, uh, the transportation issues um, are real good luck how we're going to uh, work on such projects uh, for ourselves as, as a community future. San Francisco and BART are having some transportation issues right now that I'm hoping that we're kind of navigating through okay here in the South Bay, and that we are considering how to really build the future of, of mass transit again and, and to get us out of this era of COVID. And it's, it's these affordable housing ideas that can, uh, that can really help that process. You guys have done some amazing work with parking issues that I think is an example to the country and to the state. Uh, really learn how to be more and more open with these really good ideas you have internally. Thanks for all your work. Dear City Council, my name is Juan Estrada. I'll speak via two roles today uh, regarding Policy 5-1. First, as a board member of the San Jose All District Leadership Group, which is a consortium of the leadership of the nine uh, district leadership groups in San Jose. Uh, district 7, unfortunately, doesn't have one yet, but we're working on it. And uh, we urge you to join us, about 1,000 community members, many neighborhood associations, planning department staff, and the planning commission in opposing the alternative recommendation. Now I'll speak as Greenfoot Hills staff. Uh, Greenfoot Hills has protected open spaces, farmlands, and natural resources for over 60 years in Santa Clara County and San Mateo County. Uh, and increasingly, we've been called to support or collaborate with community leaders in San Jose. Now, we urge you to support the staff recommendation, reject the alternative recommendation, and support Mayor Licardo's memo. We've heard concerns about housing today. The staff recommendation which we support would expand the area of the city where affordable housing has access to an exemption by 48% and streamline a process for both affordable housing and market rate projects. The alternative recommendation is inconsistent with the general plan and would facilitate development of huge parcels of open space without a community visioning process. That's the key. If you'd like to consider allowing the unparalleled opportunity of the 114-acre former Pleasant Hills Golf Course site, which is about 85 football fields in size, uh, then to redevelop, then the city should lead a transparent community engagement process to determine how re redevelopment could best meet the needs of the city. And so I thank you. We have Mark Lazzarini. Uh, good evening, Mayor Licardo, Mayor-elect Mahan, and the council. Uh, Mark Lazzarini with Lakeside Community, and we respectfully request that you adopt the preferred t &E committee recommended amendment to the council policy 5-1 as proposed by council members Davis and Perales for their memorandum dated of November 23rd, 23. This policy update provides future councils the opportunity to consider other parameters that would enable council to consider factors such as meeting arena goals, especially during a housing crisis assuring that specific projects that even involve a general plan amendment are heard concurrently with the zoning to assure adequate community input and involvement and that address specific community needs such as parks and infrastructure. The policy that is recommended does not preclude robust community outreach process, especially for those projects that require general plan amendment. This does not have to be a city-led staff process. Traffic patterns will change because these VMT zones are based on pre-COVID data. New modes of transportation could potentially reduce traffic impacts. Future councils need the flexibility to consider in the policy that is not overly restrictive and it provides a framework which enables some flexibility 
to adapt to these types of changes. This recommendation is about a citywide policy and not a specific project. I'd ask you to uh, support this um, recommendation from T&E. We've been involved in infill projects for over 20 years, and I can tell you the variety of issues that we address in communities, such as toxics, uh, riparian restorations, open space restorations, private junkyards, inf infrastructure division, is, is something that you need to have the flexibility to consider. Time. Thank you very much. We'll go online. Starting with Samuel Gutierrez. Hello, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Ricardo and members of the City Council. I am Samuel Gutierrez, Principal Planner for the Department of Planning and Development for the County of Santa Clara. The San Jose City Council item I am speaking to this tonight is item number 8.3, PP22-015, amendments to Title 20. For clarification of the record, this item was not scheduled for the November 16th, 2022 AOUC meeting as the county confirmed that the referral item was not complete. This was noted in the letter that was submitted to the San Jose clerk this morning in relation to this item. The county airport land use commission has not made a consistency determination for the proposed zoning amendments. There are concerns over the removal of parking minimums, which allow for more opportunities to reuse the existing parking lots for outdoor uses, such as outdoor dining, recreational uses, and outdoor vending facilities, and the increased allowance for these types of uses on properties within the airport influence areas of the San Jose Mineta and Reed Hill View airports. Though the ordinance proposes conditions that outdoor uses must be, quote, in conformance with the relevant airport comprehensive land use plans where applicable, we have concerns that the conditions are too broad and the AOC did not have an opportunity to review this ordinance and provide a comprehensive land use plan consistency determination relative to San Jose Mineta and Reed Hillview airports. The county wishes to continue to work with the city of San Jose to move complete referral applications to be considered by the AOUC as soon as possible and avoid these situations in the future. Thank you for the, your time. Rabbi Abonur. Hi, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Great, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, Mayor Ricardo, Mayor Lechman, council members. I'm Rabbi Abonur, I'm with the Natural Resource Defense Council, here to speak in strong support of item 8.3. I've already spoken with you before, so I'll keep this brief. San Jose has declared a climate emergency and needs to act on its ambitious goals. Parking and TDM reforms are proven strategies to reduce traffic and pollution. And if the city wants to take climate change seriously, this policy is a good step. Step. Your staff have put a tremendous amount of effort into this proposal, and at your direction, they've made smart changes to address issues such as crowding, payments, and shared parking. I really believe that this is a model parking and TDM ordinance for the country at this point. After this long and thoughtful development period, it's time for implementation. So please support the staff recommendation and pass this item. Thank you. Caller with last four digits, 1324. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, I wanna give some statistics, some factual data that the guy from the housing department uh, failed to provide. 95% to 115% of market rate housing goals year over year from 2016 till today have been met in the same time period, 2016 till today. The threshold of 25% has never been exceeded for low income, everything else. Okay, and I'm not gonna include affordable housing in that statistic because your affordable housing data is wrong. And here's why. You're not taking into account what is the what is going to be the uh, median income five years from now? What's that going to be? You guys have that data. You know what it's going to be. And so by you using that as the metric, 80% for affordable housing, it sounds, oh, well, that's great, affordable housing. That's why councilmen in, in uh, Cambrian area so that's why she's loving it. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
because 80% of the median income at that time in five years is going to be más o menos about $170,000 per year. That's what the median income is going to be in five years. I mean, 80% of it, because the median income is going to be about 200 grand. Okay, so the that's number one. Number two is that on Bascom Avenue in District 6, there's going to be a housing project that's going to have 600 parking spots that's right next to the VTA light rail station. So your, so your, so your parking policies is a sham. It's a lie. You guys are lying to people, and you constantly con them. And I'm going to keep coming to these meetings and calling you out on your... Janet Holt. Thank you very much um, for the opportunity. I am a resident resident of Evergreen, fairly close to the um, actual Pleasant Hills Golf Course, old Pleasant Hills Golf Course. And I would ask that you support the staff recommendation and reject the alternative recommendation tonight. Um, appropriate development should be pursued by a transparent city-led community visioning process for this 114 acre Pleasant Hills golf course land. It's it's not my first rodeo. I've been, um, been in San Jose for over 65 years. So I wanna emphasize a city-led community visioning, not a developer-led. Thank you. Matt King. Hi, good evening again, Matt King with Sacred Heart Community Service. Speaking on 8.4, I won't pretend to be an expert on this item in VMT, but I thought since I was here, I would comment on it in relation to a couple of things that were said on the dais during the siting policy conversation. Council Member Esparza invited us to show up and push for affordable housing being spread throughout the city. So I want to do that right now and encourage you to make the choice tonight that it's going to lead to more housing, particularly affordable housing in places like District 8, and to make the decision tonight that does not prop up uh, entrenching uh, exclusive areas that are cut off to uh, 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 you know most people. And then also in relation to the comment from Vice Mayor Jones about how it can be challenging and the council can make different decisions that inadvertently could interfere with the strategy. Like the siting policy, I, I think that might apply here and a very well-intentioned policy around environmental protection becoming just another way of making this place unaffordable for most people. So again, make the decision tonight that's gonna lead to the most homes, the most affordable homes being available for people. Thank you. Gabriel. Hi, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Great. Um, Gabriel Hernandez, the director for the CISA Puede Collective. Uh, we would ask that you support the Davis uh, Perales memo. And we're asking that you consider the historical redlining and segregation of families on the east side and hoping that this policy doesn't become another barrier that excludes affordable housing in certain areas, um, especially high quality affordable housing in underutilized and high DMT areas. So we're asking you again to make sure that um, this doesn't inadvertently become another barrier to allow affordable housing to, to, be, to be developed in, in the high DMT areas and underutilized um, uh, areas like that. Thank you. Trudy Ellerbeck. Greetings, Mayor and Council Members. Trudy Ellerbeck from the Mount Pleasant neighborhood that's nearby the old Pleasant Hills Golf Course. Referencing item 8.4, I ask that you support the staff recommendation and reject the alternative recommendation. Should be a city-led community visioning process rather than a developer-led. Thank you. Jeremy Bruce. Good afternoon. Jeremy Burrus with Amigos de Guadalupe, and I'm urging the city council to put our East San Jose families and children first. <clears throat> 
by allowing high quality and affordable housing in underutilized and high VMT areas and to support the Davis Perales memo. We are in a housing crisis and East San Jose deserves the same amount of attention, resources and investments as North, West and downtown San Jose. Our families and children in East San Jose deserve to have additional opportunities and resources to prosper, which is why we need to remove barriers to housing opportunities. To allow high quality housing in underutilized and high VMT areas is to desegregate housing, allow more opportunities for affordable housing, promote the vitality of East San Jose and prioritize people of color and communities of concern. We ask you to please vote to allow housing in high VMT areas. Thank you. Shauna Fetri. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, good evening, mayor and council members. My name is Shauna Fichi with the Palo Rancho Cabana Club HOA. I have served on my HOA for close to 20 years. The Palo Rancho borders two sides of the Pleasant Hills Golf Course and some homes back up to this open space. I'm asking you to reject the alternative recommendation. It lacks community involvement. Our residents deserve to be a part of the process to ensure our infrastructure, schools, and quality of life are not negatively impacted. This alternative recommendation is not responsible growth for the east side. Please support the staff recommendation and the mayor's memo and reject the alternative recommendation. Thank you. Sandra. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor-elect and Council. I support the city staff in not recommending the inclusion of the alternative recommendation in an updated policy 5-1. I ask that you ex explicitly reject it. It does not seem appropriate for the city to change policy citywide for the benefit of a single developer. I'm very concerned about the possibility of unintended consequences of the chance of the alternative recommendation might enable an entirely inappropriate development elsewhere. Appropriate development of the Pleasant Hills Golf Course par partial parcel should follow a transparent community engagement process. Thank you very much for listening tonight. Caller with last four digits, 7168. Thanks. Carmen Brammer, longtime resident of District 8. I'm asking the council to remain laser focused on solving our housing crisis. Therefore, updates to VMT should be considered. Even though there are pros and cons for various memos, it's important that every neighborhood be an active participant in solving our housing crisis. This has to include very affluent neighborhoods that are largely red zoned in the city's VMT map. For our city to move forward, these neighborhoods cannot be completely excluded from housing development. So tonight I look to the council to take action, be diligent, work out the details and find solutions to address the finer points. Thank you. Beth. Hi, good evening. Um, I ask that you support the staff recommendation and reject the alternative recommendation. I too am very concerned by the possibility of unintended consequences and the chance that the alternative recommendation might enable entirely inappropriate development elsewhere. Thank you. Green Trip. Good evening, council members. My name is Kendra and I am the policy analyst at Transform. And we're asking you to approve the parking and TDM ordinance uh, because it would support more equitable ways to live and get around while promoting strategies for walkable communities with um, just great transportation choices. And uh, we're really thrilled that equity is prioritized throughout the ordinance, um, that it awards twice the number of points for providing transit passes for nearby low-income communities. And this is incredibly important because um, these communities rely on public transportation to access critical services and resources um, to improve their quality of life. 
And uh, we're also excited that the, that the ordinance is including shared use parking and unbundled parking. Um, we're currently working with a tech tool called Parkade, and they've shown that um, unbundling and shared parking can be made easy, um, and they can reduce parking demand as much as 20%. And not only does this mean reduce spillover, but overall shared and unbundling can really allow for maximizing space for additional homes that's really much needed during our house housing crisis. So um, please support this ordinance to support a more vibrant and affordable city. Thank you. Rani Fisher. Good evening, Mayor Licardo, Mayor-elect Mayen and Council. My name is Rani Fisher and I represent the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. We are dismayed by the alternative proposal to streamline housing in areas zoned for private recreation and open space without robust community engagement. We ask that you adopt the planning department staff recommendation for updating transportation analysis policy 5-1 and reject the alternative recommendation that would facilitate development on private recreation and open space land. The proposed alternative recommendation is harmful because it is inconsistent with the city's general plan and would facilitate development of open space without community visioning, such as is, such as is currently provided for multiple other large par parcels in San Jose. Moreover, the alternate recommendation encourages housing far from the city center thus increasing VMT, also inconsistent with the city's new climate change initiative. Thank you. Alex Schur. Hey, this is Alex Schur with Catalyze SV on eight, item 8.3. My gosh, is the day finally arrived? It has been three or four years in the making. I remember talking with city staff about this before the pandemic. And I'm so glad the day is finally here. This is a change, maybe 57 years in the making since we first came up with this policy. And I think now we're going in the right direction, a direction that emphasizes other ways of getting around, like walking, biking, public transportation, and emerging mobility solutions that cuts down on something that none of us like, which is congestion in our communities, and the air pollution that it causes, that it allows more affordable housing, more housing in general, more community benefits, more active ground floors to substitute for often unused parking spaces that are not needed. Parking spaces that may cost $50,000 or more to build that transforms data finds are often unused in developments throughout our city that so many of our, uh, our residents, including residents of affordable housing, don't use but are paying for as part of their rent. Uh, the case couldn't be clearer for this change. And by the way, this change will still, for those who are questioning or concerned, allow parking to be built by developers. It just won't mandate how much the city requires. And that's a very important amount of flexibility that we need to get the type of development that is crucial in San Jose. Thank you for staff and council for sticking this out. Let's affirm council the vote you took in June and pass this with flying colors. David Newell. Uh, excuse me. Hi, Honorable Mayor and City Council. I'm David Noel, President of Erickson Neighborhood Association in District 9. On behalf of neighborhoods throughout the city, I ask that the new TDM parking policy includes some flexibility to address overflow parking from new neighborhoods into established neighborhoods and from businesses into neighborhoods or into businesses without firm parking agreements. Consider including provisions that could legally and enforceably limit the actual number of cars generated by developments to match the parking provided. In a recent District 9 leadership group meeting, Senator Dave Partizzi, co-author of SB 9, stated the city should revisit their objective zoning standards within the context of SB 9, especially parking ratios, but also other zoning standards such as setbacks and so on. Please be careful to preserve what little land use authority 
that our city still has to address projects built under state laws, such as SB9 and SB35. Finally, our future depends on transit that gets people from their homes to their jobs in a time comparable to driving. While increasing housing density uh, enables better transit, it doesn't guarantee it. So please vigorously advocate for efficient and effective use of future transit funding. Thank you. Mohan Mahal. Yeah, this is Mohan Mahal. Uh, I want to thank the council, Mayor Sam Carter and Matt Mahal uh, for their wonderful job they've done for the city of San Jose. We all know that housing has been a major problem and homelessness has been a big issue. We are looking forward to work with the city and the other officials. We can provide housing, uh, which is affordable, is going to be net zero and uh, fulfill the fuels. I would allow, it will be nice if you can allow us to do the housing in the areas where we can get some land from the city or the state, you know. Uh, we can also build shelters for the homeless people, which are going to be completely net zero, energy efficient, sustainable, and have no impact on the climate part of it. I'm also requesting that you look into a possibility if a developer wants to build homeless shelters and provide them to the city to be able to have these homes ready uh, to be used uh, because we have technology developed to build them in a factory and we can make them very economical and very efficiently. You know, I'm looking forward to work with the, the city and Mr. Mahan and Mr. Sam Lakarda uh, to be able to work and develop the housing for, and we can also do affordable housing. Thank you very much. Looking forward to engaging yourself. I'm from District 2, uh, San Jose. Thank you very much. Bye. Gary Dillabo. Gary? Oh, so sorry about that. <laughs> Good evening. Um, my name is Gary Dillabo, and uh, I'm one of the principals in the Lakeside Community LLC. Uh, I'm here to support Council Member Davis's and Perales's recommendation to approve the TE Committee's preferred BMT policy. Um, you know, this option will allow for a community process before zoning and a project is filed for approval. As most of you know, infill sites can be extremely challenging and require a tremendous amount of input from a variety of stakeholders. And that's why we believe that engaging the community as early as possible is critical. And uh, you know, our goal is to deliver design that should be embraced and we hope celebrated by the community, uh, as well as the groups that manage critical city services. I mean, these things all have to work together. Um, and our goal really is that, if, or I guess I should say, if we're unable to achieve this kind of support throughout the, uh, the community, and that we just haven't done our jobs, and we haven't delivered what the community needs. You know, areas like the east side deserve world-class solutions. This 114 acres shouldn't sit fallow for another 10 years. And we will work hard with the community to make sure that we deliver something that we'll be extraordinarily proud of. And uh, we'll try to engage them throughout the entire process. Thank you. Marley Smith. Hello, Mayor Licardo and council members. My name is Marley Smith, Director of Transportation Policy at Silicon Valley Leadership Group. I'd like to share our support for staff's recommendations for the parking and TDM ordinance update. The Silicon Valley Leadership Group is proud to have co-sponsored AB 2097 for several reasons, including the reduced cost of building housing. When a parking spot is not required to be factored into the cost of a housing unit and parcels are proposed for development, can uh, parcels dedicated for development can dedicate more of that land on site to housing instead of parking lots. Additionally, these parking minimums have had un unintended consequences on tree canopy and water runoff. When we build out parking, it should be because it's absolutely necessary, not mandated. This policy is not implementing a maximum allowable parking limit, but rather allows property owners to de determine the right size for their needs. This policy allows businesses to have more flexibility with buildings they can use without being constrained by parking minimums, restraining a, a, removing a strain on small businesses. The improvements to the TDM program are critical and ensure that we have a measurable data to ensure that we are miss meeting our 2040 climate goals of VMT reduction, as well as creating a predictable system for property owners to work with. We urge your support on this item and thank you for your time and consideration. C. Ferrigno.
Hi, um, I'm a resident of the Shasta Hanshit neighborhood, which is actually nowhere near the Pleasant Hills Golf Course. But I don't really think I need to live nearby to realize that the staff recommendation is worthy of support and the alternative recommendation is not. Um, as to the parking, 8.3, I think it is. I worry about the no minimum parking um, allocation and how that will actually work. If we have developers just going after building um, massive structures to either house people or businesses, and if they're not allocating parking to accommodate those people, um, who do they think is going to rent and or lease those spaces? I mean, in the ideal world, I understand it would be great if people were biking and using mass transit, but that is not going to happen overnight. And what I fear is going to occur is there will be many structures sitting vacant. And how is that going to help the city of San Jose? So I worry about that. And then on um, affordable housing, I'm all for it, but I also want the city to very much keep in mind conserving our history. There, my, my husband and I purchased in 2005, we bought in at a premium into a conservation neighborhood, um, knowing we we're gonna have to delay our retirement because of that. But I really don't want that investment to go away because the city decides to change the plans, the city and or the state. I fear for that. Thank you for your time. Wesley Lee. Hi, um, thank you for taking my call. Uh, this is Wesley Lee. I'm a resident of District 8 for 30 years and a community member of the District 8 Community Roundtable Land Use Committee. And I've been involved in a number of land use issues over the years. I want to state my opposition to the alternative recommendation that circumvents uh, public comment and environmental review. I have strong objections to a policy that short circuits the review process. This could lead to harm to the environment and could impact the quality of life of diligent taxpaying citizens who deserve to have their voices heard. Further, I'm concerned about unintended consequences in the rush to decision. The best outcomes come about when all stakeholders can fully discuss and examine the issues. And let's not have a redo of the Measure B-like proposal that was in uh, 2018, a measure that was sponsored by and for the benefit of a single developer. Let's trust the process of full reviews, not cut corners. I ask that you reject the alternative recommendation. Thank you. Matthew Reed. Yes, good evening, uh, Mayor Council staff, Matthew Reed, Silicon Valley at home. I wanna start by just acknowledging that the parking and transportation demand item here, 8.3 is, is tremendously good and important work and staff deserves more attention on this than it seems that they are likely to get in the discussion that you will have. And we're proud to have been a part of a coalition supporting this and appreciate the comments of those who have spoken to this. Um, we strongly support the core underlying VMT policy item that expands where we can build affordable housing in the city. Um, on the topic of the alternative around 5.1, this is clearly difficult. There are very complex interests at play. I really am not here. I cannot speak tonight in support of any of the specific options before you. However, I do wish to speak on the principle that underutilized land within what is the boundary of the developed footprint of the city must be seen as an essential asset for developing housing with a focus on critically needed affordable housing going forward. Areas the size of the closed golf course are too important to be taken off the table and has been noted as one of the critical sites that will shape the future of the east and the southeast sides of the city. The scale of these types of properties allow for comprehensive strategies, community and public benefits, many of which have been laid out in uh, memos and in the staff report. A robust planning process with community engagement is essential to anything at this scale and the city um, have, have a driving interest uh, and must continue to have a driving interest in the affordable housing. 
It's hard to avoid the reality of our current housing crisis where the lack of affordable opportunities pushes our residents and workforce into commutes from Gilroy or Stockton or Modesto. Christine Kay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm speaking on behalf of my wife and myself. Um, we are residents of District A, and our house actually backs into the uh, vacant golf course. Um, I ask that you support the staff recommendation and reject the alternative recommendation. Um, it does not seem appropriate for the city to change policy citywide for the benefit of a single developer. And lastly, given the mayor's new memo supports the staff recommendation and community visioning, I ask that you support the mayor's memo. Thank you. Jake Wild. Hi, hello, good evening. My name is Jake Wild, and I'm calling in tonight to ask that you please approve the 8.3 recommendation and eliminate parking minimums. Automobile dependence is one of the greatest threats that receives the least attention. It is a threat to our environment, a threat to our sustainability, and it is a threat to our health. 51% of San Jose's greenhouse gas emissions come from vehicle transport. The U.S. has the highest rate of gasoline consumption and the most cars per capita of any nation on Earth. A city where you must use a multi-ton mass made of plastic, steel, and rare earth metals to pick up a bag of groceries is not sustainable. Our way of life and reliance on the automobile may seem like the natural order, but there absolutely is another way. So please continue to put the city of San Jose on a course for a truly sustainable future by eliminating parking minimums and breaking the cycle of automobile dependence. And hopefully in the future, the city can even explore uh, parking maximums. Thank you. Robert Rees. Hello, my name is Robert Rees, and I chair the Land Use Committee of the District 8 Community Roundtable and appreciate the opportunity to share my personal thoughts tonight on 844 BMT. The mayor's memorandum understands that meaningful community engagement on the front end of the development of the Pleasant Hills Golf Course is appropriate best practice and broadens the discussion on achieving more affordable housing. It also supports the staff recommendation, which maximizes affordable housing in high VMT areas and explicitly rejects the alternative recommendation. South of Story Road on the east side, there are about 700 acres of vacant and underdeveloped land, which were in the old Evergreen Development Policy area, which was closed in 2020. We can do our best as a community for the east side's land use future together and with more amenities for all our residents by discouraging development by exception to the general plan, which you just recently updated after hearing the findings of an incredibly diverse general plan task force. Exceptions which are designed to accommodate one developer and a 114 acre site are especially troubling in the context of the large development potential of the east side of these 700 acres. In late 2019, community members first met with our council members team at Daniel Reyes' home to discuss the closing of the Evergreen Development Policy in the future. The community's reasonable request for meaningful engagement in community planning and potentially is po potentially being brushed aside tonight in favor of an exception to the recently adopted general plan based on the needs of one developer's financial transaction on the Pleasant Hills Golf Course. Thank you very much for your consideration. Lalo Mendez. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Lalo Mendez from Catalyze SV and Downtown San Jose resident from District 3. I'm happy to see item 8.3 come back tonight. It's uh, way past due, as we will hear tonight. It has been decades since there have been significant changes to this outdated parking and TDM zoning policy. In reviewing the TDM recommendations, I really like the flexibility that this policy gives developers, especially affordable housing developers who struggle to secure very competitive funding sources and deliver the homes that we're talking about tonight. So this unnecessary prescribed parking requirements only adds additional burdens. So I support the staff's recommendation to update these and the TDM plan before you. 
Um, I also believe that this policy will supplement the affordable housing production efforts, which we just discussed in the previous item. So I'm very supportive of it. Overall, I like the recommendation policies. I want to thank everyone who has worked with community members as well as community organizations uh, to present this proposal tonight. I urge you to support item 8.3. Thank you. Gabby Mendoza. Gabby, you may need to update your Zoom. Uh, moving on to the next speaker, Angie. Angie. Okay, moving on, Gina. Gina, you may need to update your Zoom as well. Moving on to uh, Lawrence Ames. Hi, I'm Larry Ames, chair of the District 6 Neighborhood Leaders Group. Hope you've seen our letter on policy 5.1. We support your work to balance the providing of housing, especially affordable housing, with the protection of our environment by having projects planned and designed to reduce vehicle miles traveled as mandated by the state. We oppose the part called the alternative recommendation, apparently added to help a developer of one unused golf course bypass a transparent and public review process. Like many other speakers tonight, our concern has been with unintended consequences, whether by misinterpretation or miswording of the policy, this alternative might somehow green light inappropriate development of lands across the city from El Viso to Coyote Valley. To quote from the mayor's memo, a single parcels redevelopment should not drive land use and transportation policies citywide implications. Please reject the alternative recommendation. Thank you. Jordan Grimes. Yes, good evening, Council Honorable Mayor. Jordan Grimes, South Bay Resilience Manager with Greenbelt Alliance. You're here tonight in strong support of 8.3, the parking and TDM policy updates. Um, we've been really proud to work with city staff on this over the last several years. There has been something of a groundswell on this policy change, both in cities across the country, uh, the latest being Anchorage, Alaska, of all places. Uh, but San, San Jose really was on the forefront of this, and it's, it's exciting to finally be at this point. Um, we really are talking about smart, sound public policy change backed by data here. Um, current parking policy is a massive impediment on our efforts to solve housing, homelessness, and uh, climate issues. Um, UC Berkeley's Turner Center for Housing Innovation estimates that the average parking spot in the Bay Area costs between $35,000 to $70,000 per space based on parking type. That money could go towards so many things, but most importantly, changing this policy means that many projects which aren't feasible today could be tomorrow and will allow many more people to live in San Jose who cannot do so currently. This isn't about eliminating parking, contrary to what you may have heard. This is about creating choice um, and allowing builders who know what it takes to make their buildings work, create better and more efficient projects. This is about creating the right amount of parking, not about eliminating it entirely. Um, we are really at the point here where we need to abandon the woefully ineffective traffic and parking policies of yesteryear in favor of changes that will actually create the outcomes that we want. More affordable housing, less traffic, fewer greenhouse gas emissions, and a more sustainable and resilient uh, community. So we urge you to support that uh, tonight and support 8.3. Um, and then on on 8.4, I, I realize that the items are lumped together and, and I'm running out of time. Um, but just okay, going back to Gabby Mendoza. Hi, yes. How are you? My name is Israel Mendoza. I live in District 7 and I work in District 5. I'm calling in today in support of Davis and Perales Memo. Uh, listen, I work with a lot of uh, families that they don't have a place to, to, to live. So we in a, in a big crisis. I don't need to tell you that, right? You guys are very, very uh, smart people, you guys know, but we need more tools, we need more housing. And the truth is that the people that they need the housing don't mind riding the bus. 
So thank you for, for uh, don't worry about the parking thingy. So thank you and I'm calling in support of that memo. Thank you. Gina. Gina. Gina, you're unmuted, we can't hear you. All right, moving on to Brian. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. First of all, you do a great job at this and I really appreciate it. The last two nights have been, I just wanna thank all of you. You know, It, it wasn't easy, all the decisions you made. I, I would uh, recommend going with Mayor Licardo's um, memo and the staff recommendation. Um, things are changing. Just remember though, that a lot of people have to have a truck in order to do plumbing and electrical work and they need to be able to park it close so no one <laughs> takes their tool which you see on next door all the time that's that's a real sad thing anyways thank you for all you do i really appreciate it have a nice evening sangeeta hi can you hear me Yes. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Sanita and I'm an organizer at Save the Day. And tonight I'll be commenting on agenda item 8.3. And I encourage you to approve the parking policy ordinance. This ordinance is aligned with Save the Bay's goals of equitable climate resilience. And we believe it'll help San Jose meet its ambitious climate goals. From an environmental perspective, this parking ordinance will help reduce greenhouse gas emissions from single occupancy vehicle trips. Data shows that transportation accounts for nearly 50% of San Jose's greenhouse gas emissions, with 75% of trips taken by private vehicles. Because of its emissions reduction benefits, the removal of parking minimums is aligned with both Climate San Smart San Jose and San Jose's goal of carbon neutrality by 2030. Removing parking minimums will also help protect the bay from polluted runoff. Parking lots tend to be large paved areas that increase polluted stormwater runoff negatively impacting water quality in San Jose's creeks, rivers, and ultimately the bay. These large lots also reduce the livability of cities, decrease walkability, and take up space that could better serve the community. This parking ordinance is equitable, data-driven, and will move San Jose towards its climate goals. On behalf of Save the Bay, I'd like to reiterate my support for this ordinance, and thank you for your time. Caller with last four digits, 6409. Hello, uh, am, I, am I live? Yes. Yeah, my name is Alan Garcia. I live in Eastside over by the golf course. And uh, I've got a couple of things. This is, I, I actually support the, the staff recommendation and reject the alternative recommendation. It does not seem appropriate for the city to change policy citywide for the benefit of a single developer. I am very concerned by the possibility of unintended consequences and the chance for the alternative recommendation might enable entirely inappropriate development elsewhere. Appropriate development should be preceded by a transparent city-led community visioning process for the 114-acre Pleasant Hills Golf Course. <clears throat> Given the mayor's new memo <clears throat> excuse me, supports the staff recommendation and community visioning. I ask that you support the mayor's memo. Thank you very much. Back to council. Thank you. Thank you to all the members of the community who came out to speak. Um, I want to suggest that we would take these um, in sequential order and start with 8.3 because I suspect that will be simpler to resolve, or at least may take less time. Um, so I, everyone keep your hands up and I'll just go around and ask, you wanna speak first on 8.3 and if not, we'll just get to a motion there and then we'll move on to 8.4. Council Member Foley? Yes, I plan to speak on 8.3. Okay, go ahead. I full, I'm fully supportive of the elimination of parking minimums uh, citywide, in fact, 
in my first year at council, I actually authored a memo asking to reduce parking minimum. So it, I'm glad to see that here we are four years later, finally bringing a reduction or removing the parking minimum requirements. I'm actually, so it, 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 this is finally coming to fruition. It's very exciting. But I think it's important to clarify one thing, and that is that this policy does not remove parking at all. It, me it merely gives, or current parking, it merely gives the developer options on the amount of parking that they need to develop along with their project. project. In other words, right-sizing the parking. How many parking lots do we see that are big shopping centers that the parking lot is half empty. So we need to correct that and make sure that that space is utilized for other things and not necessarily encouraging parking. I appreciate the mayor's memorandum covering the implications for the alfresco of the parking and TDM ordinance update. Overall, the San Jose alfresco program has been a tremendous success. As some callers uh, or, or uh, members of the public mentioned today, it's really wonderful to be able to go sit out and have uh, a meal outdoors and not be concerned about the impact of COVID. You get to sit outside and if you've ever traveled around other parts of the country, there's a lot of outdoor, par outdoor seating and so having it here in San Jose is really wonderful and, and actually one of those positive benefits, if there are any, of, uh, of COVID because we were forced outdoors. Overall, the, San Jose, the program is a success, but there are bad actors in the alfresco business and we meet, need to make sure that we take care of them. And by bad actors, I mean those businesses who are really close to residences and who still are not consider, not good neighbors in that their, na their music is too loud, they're not considerate about the neighbors nearby. So I hope that the Alfresco program will continue. I'm very supportive of that. But we need to make sure that the businesses who have these, have Alfresco programs are also good neighbors to the neighbors around them. So I, I encourage everyone here, and I know we have a representative who has a business and he has an alfresco program and I'm sure you're a good neighbor to your your fellow residents who are nearby. So with that, I'm happy to move the mayor's November 29th memo on uh, item 8.3 along with the staff's recommendation. Second. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Foley. Uh, <clears throat> Councilmember Perales. Uh, no, I'll keep my hand up for the next item. I'll, okay, I'll, 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 we'll come right back to you. Motion, thank you. Any other discussion on 8.3? Uh, Councilmember Mahan. Thanks, just briefly, uh, Mayor, agree with Councilmember Foley's comments fully. Um, you know, I want to just also express <coughs> my gratitude to Mayor Licardo and Councilmember Davis for their uh, championing of, of the Alfresco program. I think it's been a great success. I've heard from many business owners across the city, and I'm glad we're taking steps to continue to empower our small business owners. And then I want to say I, I am also supportive of the uh, parking requirement changes that staff's recommended in the TDM plan, though I, I really hope we'll be closely monitoring the impacts. I'm, I'm particularly worried about some neighborhoods, particularly along the Alum Rock Corridor, that face pretty significant challenges with parking and so I just you know I'm, I know that we're going to implement this in good faith and, and make sure that we are uh, coming back and taking additional steps if, if we're unduly burdening those communities so I just wanted to flag that because of the the community concern that I have heard in some neighborhoods but very supportive of running this experiment and, and think there's a lot of value to it so thank you thank you uh, Councilmember Cohen yeah thank you and I want to uh, thank staff for bringing this forward today I've been looking forward to this opportunity to provide flexibility and discretion to uh, developers and, and businesses as they build out. Just, just a question kind of triggered by uh, um, something Councilmember Foley mentioned and, and something I think I've asked before, I think it was at a T&E meeting a while ago. I know this is somewhat different, but now that we have this change we, and we have a lot of this excess parking that's been built in, by previous developments, is it, I, I'd like us to consider what, what we might be able to do to encourage and assist the conversion of some of that parking back to 
uh, green space or open space or other kinds of property so that, because we know, I, I think we can all think of places that are, are vast empty parking lots. Um, and then the other thing I was just gonna mention is back to the concerns about development that doesn't, um, that may, that, you know, the concerns about some neighborhoods having, being impacted by reduced parking. Um, I think we ought to be also thinking about how to build some partnerships between spaces that exist in some in one place and and projects that are being built elsewhere so that there's some ability to share parking when it's when it's heavily and used at certain times of day in one type of development and then empty at other types of day we ought to we ought to come up with a, a, a I know there's probably studies out there about how you can do some sharing and I, I don't know if you want to chime in on that at all or Sure, I'll take that. Um, Ramses Madhu, uh, Department of Transportation. Thanks for the question. So, so one, whether it would be the space within parking lots could be converted to other use, that, that is possible under this policy. Now, change of use needs to be uh, um, looked at when, when we do that, so yeah. Um, whether that can be then brought to open space is actually an interesting question that I don't think we've thought through and something we'll, we'll have to get back to you on. Um, I would say that it, it could. I think um, if there's a new development proposal, depending on what it is, they would have to meet their PDO, PIO requirements, and they could do open space on site if they meet those requirements. Um, and it does provide opportunities for the city's uh, park department to um, purchase land, potentially, in areas that um, are underserved and identified the need for parks. Uh, and sometimes these, these spaces may be what we call popos, which are privately owned, publicly accessible spaces that could be part of a development. So those are probably the most likely avenues where you could turn uh, a parking lot into a park. Is that a reverse of a Joni Mitchell song? I'm not sure, but <laughs> you see what I'm getting at. But, <laughs> that's kind of what I'm envisioning, but no, I, I, actually before you go on to the second question, let me just clarify my thinking on the first as well. I go to a big a shopping center where I know that's overparked. There's no, there's areas of that parking lot that are almost never touched. And I'm not thinking about something where there would be, there's no financial incentive for the owner of that shopping center to ever just rip out parking, it costs them money. But I'm wondering if there's a policy, uh, some kind of procedures we could put in place to help them receive grants or something else that would remove some pavement and just put in some trees. Or some, or when I say green space, I'm not even thinking about parks, but you know, little, little uh, islands of green that help with rainstorm runoff and just providing more trees in our in our um, urban footprint. So that's kind of what I'm thinking. I, I'm not sure what there is, but I'm I'm wondering if there's some kind of financial assistance that could be provided to help people do that. Because I I, I wouldn't expect that we would say you have to do it because it's a, it's an expense. Yeah, I mean I, I don't know that we have we're not aware of anything either, but it's the kind of thing that that could be explored. Okay. Yeah, but it's a good idea. Yeah. And then on the second question, um, multiple things there. One, um, in Move San Jose, our citywide transportation plan that was adopted earlier this year by council, um, we specifically call out shared parking as a uh, approach um, to managing parking, um, particularly in these kinds of cases. Um, uh, in our downtown plan, we're also really uh, uh, pressing for folks to start sharing parking and using that. And that's, it's a, a kind of, I would say, a, one of the transportation policies and, and strategies we'd really like to see. Right, because it's it's an immense amount of land that's that sits there empty, and yeah. So this business still needs parking. Great, let's let's share. Um, do we have a particular program that's kind of pulling the threads within that conversation? Sometimes downtown, particularly when we're the ones managing the parking, but we don't have a, a staff member kind of watching that per se. But we certainly uh, support that, um, and this policy uh, 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 does have that within the uh, the TDM element as well. Right, that uh, uh, developments can, um, new developments can use uh, uh, that type of shared parking to get TDM points. Right, so there is uh, instigation and uh, um, incentives to use it in that side. Yeah, and I, I sometimes th I sometimes see what I consider a lack of creativity amongst developers. Although I, I think there's also this this feeling of, you know, we need to have security in our parking lots so we can't share and. I, I'm pulling out the example of the actually the flea market potential development by the BART station. The, the, we've been hearing, well, there's going to be a big parking garage for the commercial buildings, and that's going to be commercial only because we're afraid people, we don't want people who are going to lease that building to feel that people who are using it on weekends and nights for going there for shopping and for people who live in the apartments might be getting too close to commercial buildings. And I think we ought to consider policies in the future that will change that mindset. 
hey, we don't, we don't need to have a city that, that has dedicated parking for every structure that's gonna go empty for large portions of the day or, or week. So just, just something I think to think about. I just wanna note though, getting at the you know, idea of under, un, using underutilized, underutilized parking for other open spaces or other activities that, I mean, the Alfresco program is actually kind of getting at that, right? And we've been very successful. So I just wanna highlight that is at least one program we've had that is really working about taking these underutilized parking spaces and allowing you know, third space is public engagement, people getting together with their neighbors in an outdoor environment. It's really, really wonderful place making in this city. So yeah. it's one of the shining things I think that came out of COVID. Agreed. I just also, I'm concerned also about new development that's gonna come that's gonna build unnecessary parking. <laughs> that, and I've seen that in some of the plans that I've been looking at. Where, so just, I don't know how we, we, we go about that, but I want to just keep we, it. We'll mind. continue to develop policy and thoughts around that because thank you. all of our policies point to us trying to do that. All right, thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Esparza. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, Councilmember Davis and the mayor for Alfresco. Um, I agree, it's uh, been really successful and it's been a lifesaver for a lot of businesses. Um, I can think of some on Monterey that just wouldn't have uh, survived, much less thrived um, without it. And, uh, but I did want to echo Councilmember Foley's comments on, um, I, I think that we can achieve a balance um, on, uh, we've had a few issues in District 7, as I'm sure other folks have had um, in some parts of the city where folks have gotten loud and it is a little bit of a nuisance. And I think, uh, I think those are issues that I'm confident that we'll be able to work through them um, so that uh, the Alfresco program can continue to, to thrive. On the parking, um, I, I know it's kind of on a smaller scale, but I believe District 6 has actually probably something to teach us on parking sharing agreements in Willow Glen, but uh, I, I think it's a great idea. and would love to see how, as a city, we can encourage that even more. Thanks, that's it for me. All right, thank you. Uh, yes, and thanks also to uh, Blagi Zalalic who worked so hard out on the, uh, out in, on the streets in many neighborhoods to help implement that, um, uh, the uh, outdoor dining in so many places. Okay, and also a lot of folks I know at Public Works and DOT are working very hard on that. Okay, so uh, any other comments on 8.3? Let's vote on that now. Uh, that is on Councilmember Foley's motion, then we'll come back to A4. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Sparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, uh, on to 8.4. Councilmember Frost, you had your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, staff, for the, the long and diligent work on this. Uh, I know we, we met numerous times, kind of going back and forth, trying to figure out uh, a pathway forward. Um, and so I appreciate that and the, the uh, presentation today. And to the uh, community members that participated, um, I will say uh, I heard some comments that I wanted to address um, that were concerning, and I'm not sure sure where they were stemming from, but but uh, some misunderstanding out there that uh, what myself and Council Member Davis were advocating for in this alternative um, uh, recommendation um, and that the T&E committee actually recommended unanimously uh, that somehow that included a process uh, or, or skipping of the process uh, for any particular area of, of development within the city, namely, as, as was brought up today, uh, the Pleasant Hills, uh, former, former Pleasant Hills golf course. Uh, that is furthest from the truth. There is no interest, uh, nor is there no direction to try and, and eliminate um, community engagement. In fact, um, there was a specific uh, direction in, in the memo that we stated. Uh, there, there may be different processes, and in this case, leaders of that process, uh, if we had a staff initiated one versus if um, a interested developer were to, in essence, be in charge of leading the process. But inevitably, 
um, community engagement would be a must, whether it's a former Pleasant Hills golf course or really any uh, development property of this significance, one that would indeed need a council uh, overriding consideration, something that we know we've, we've taken up numerous votes throughout uh, the years. Um, and in this case, that was, was my interest. It actually stemmed above and beyond the Pleasant Hills Golf Course, which is indeed one of those locations that that um, that, that may come into uh, factor with this vote. But it, it really is a citywide policy, and that's something that I um, stressed over with staff on and how do we ensure that we're creating a policy that really is looking at opportunities that could be created throughout the entire city, and how do we not handcuff a future council from uh, being able to evaluate a particular parcel, uh, underutilized remnant parcel of land that, uh, that maybe could produce something that the community could get behind, that the council could get behind, that, that uh, produces uh, a, a significant uh, benefit to the community, specifically in, in areas like affordable housing to help us meet our arena goals, uh, things that we know that we have a major need for. Uh, and so I wanted to keep that doorway open, if you will, rather than essentially sh shut it now um, and keep an opportunity open. That was really the, the intent from the beginning and trying to find an, uh, a narrow pathway uh, with staff to get there. Ultimately, we didn't get there clearly, uh, right? I think there was a slight difference of, of opinion on how we might achieve that goal. Um, had a recommendation out of the committee that was supported uh, unanimously and, and staff is, is not in, in favor of that. I will say um, it was a bit interesting to see that the recommendation come forward um, from staff that kind of dismissed the teeny uh, unanimous recommendation um, and, and rather than sort of presenting uh, that as, as what was, was coming out of the committee, um, albeit there's, you know, it's a, it's a difference uh, of opinion and I'm hoping my colleagues are willing to see the benefit of the alternative recommendation to see that uh, it absolutely uh, includes community, uh, extensive community uh, engagement as uh, is, is stated in, in the memo that I co-signed with Councilmember Davis. And I know Councilmember Davis is uh, under the weather and battling COVID tonight. And, and so uh, I don't know if she'll be able to to chime in fully, but, um, but I appreciate her, her work and diligence on this as well. We have, submitted a memorandum with a uh, slight change from that um, alternative. And that's in regards to that recommendation one, as you may see in our memo, um, there is some extensive language that gets very, very specific. This is also something that I uh, went back and forth on and disagreed with staff in regards to uh, not wanting to have specified language percentages um, and rather allow a future council to really to make those determinations, uh, then, then bake them in uh, now. Um, and, and we see that as well um, in the mayor's memo. I, I wanna stay away from the specificities of trying to nail down what a percentage may be now and actually allow that community conversation to happen. Uh, and then a council can decide if, if indeed it is significant enough. I think we've put enough guardrails to say, you know, here's the, here's the goal, it should include uh, significant investment uh, of meeting our arena goals uh, and, and, and be able to, to address issues like that affordable housing. But other than that, not being super specific uh, and not trying to assume uh, that, that we know exactly uh, what that community may want uh, and what the council may be thinking in the future. And so uh, we've changed that language as is suggested in our recommendation one, and then um, uh, asking for the extensive community outreach and recommendation two, and then as staff stated, they, they are in agreement with, which is um, to ensure that uh, um, the um, project, uh, proposed project uh, will come in as part of the zoning application uh, to be heard concurrently with the general plan amendment. Uh, and I know staff supports that. So I will move uh, the memorandum from myself and council member Davis, and I am happy to include um, Councilmember Jimenez's memo as well. Second. That's motion. Thanks. All right. Motion for Councilmember Pross, second for Councilmember Davis. Councilmember Pross, can I ask you a question for clarification based on the statements you made early on in your comments? 
Does that mean that uh, the memo contemplates that it would be a city-led uh, process? No, no, it doesn't. Okay, so to be clear, what the city is recommending is a city-led process, and what you're recommending is a developer-led process. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, Council Member Jimenez. Yeah, thank you for uh, for all the work, staff. Uh, thanks, uh, Council Member Perales, for including the memo that uh, my office authored. Appreciate that. Um, uh, a lot of the comments that you shared, Council Member Perales, resonated with me. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more, and I'm sure the mayor is going to chime in on you know on, on this um, distinction between. And, and obviously, the distinction is clear, but I'm wondering what the outcome, how the outcome potentially differs as it relates to a process led by developer or a process led by city staff. Um, but but I, I, I did have one question. Uh, I think Mike Robrio is there, right? I can't see everyone in the chamber, but- I, He is, yes. Yeah, M Michael, I, I guess, and, and to anyone that can answer this question, I, I'm not on t &E, but something that did stand out to me is that the, it seemed like the, the, the what, was, what has been framed and put forward as an alternate recommendation that was uh, submitted to the planning commission that came out as a as a um, unanimous vote from T and E, and then it was then it moved to the planning commission, and then that unanimous vote was presented as the alternate recommendation, if you will, and staff's will, if you will, or staff's recommendation was put as the prime recommendation. And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about how how it's decided where the committee recommendation is placed and how that's framed when it goes before the planning commission. Because I, I found that just interesting and I was curious if you could talk about that. And so when we, when we go to planning commission, we're making staff's recommendation based on our you know, professional judgment. So that's what we presented to planning commission. However, given that, that the t and &E did have a recommendation that they were, that they directed to move forward through the process, we did do a pretty um, thorough and robust job to present that recommendation to the Planning Commission, yeah. which we okay. had a difference, a difference of opinion on. Yeah, no, I, no, I, to I totally understand that. Again. I guess, uh, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily track all too often sort of... <laughs> How often that occurs or not, but, but it just stood out to me. And, and in my mind, I thought, I mean, I appreciate you saying that the, the main recommendation was staff's professional opinion, which obviously we all respect and appreciate, right? All the work, you all are the professionals in the room. Uh, but it seems to me that, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how this would happen in the future or if my colleagues see any value with this, but it seems to me that if, it, if, uh, if a uh, unanimous recommendation comes out of the committee, I think it would be even more appropriate for, to present that as the recommendation and the alternate be presented as a staff recommendation. Like essentially say, committee said this, and this is the recommendation that we're bringing forward, but staff thinks that it should be X or Y, right? And I don't know, it, it just seemed a little odd to me, but uh, anyhow, uh, I, I wanna hear a little bit more and, and I'm sure the mayor is gonna have some comments on, on the, um, on, on the recommendation before us. Uh, one, one very last question I have, Michael, is can you, you know, I, I'm fam very familiar with that part of the city and that specific project that has been mentioned time and again, um, but, but I know that nothing's been formally submitted. So I have to tell you that it's a little weird for me to sort of, you know, so we've placed it on the table, if you will, but nothing's been submitted. Um, but what I'm curious about is has no, no visioning, no planning been done for that big plot of land ever. I mean, can, can you educate me a little bit about that? Because it seems strange to me that we all don't already have sort of a path forward as to what we want to see there. So a couple of things. So, oh, sorry. You, um, so there actually was a general plan amendment submitted on that property um, on fr last Friday, I believe. So we do have oh. a, a general plan amendment on file now. Um, and yeah, in terms of doing specific, uh, planning for that uh, for that property, there there has not been. There was a um, evergreen. Um, what was it called? Visioning process. What was it called? There was an evergreen process. There was a, a a process to like look at updating the evergreen area development policy. Actually, my wife led that way back oh. when. <laughs> up, yeah. Anyway, so. Um, 
That process happened, I think, in 2007, 2008, and it was a conversation about how could more housing go forward in, in the Evergreen area um, that included Pleasant Hill Golf Course, but also included the properties owned by Carlberg and other properties, Arcadia, I believe, was included. Um, and the process essentially fell apart because there was the community, there was an agreement uh, as part of the engagement process about what type of amenities and things should come out of um, new housing development in the area. And one of the property owners did agree with um, what was being asked of developers, that was Carl Berg, and the other ones at the 11th hour dropped out and did not want to do it. So the item did not move forward, there was an agreement. So that's really the last time there was sort of a comprehensive conversation in Evergreen about um, what, 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 could, what are the things that are kind of needed or what could happen, what should happen if we allow, if we open the area up for more housing. Right, and then, and then can you help me understand your perspective as it relates to uh, the potential outcome, whether it's a community-led process or whether it's a uh, developer-led process? I mean, it, it, you know, both are obviously processes that involve the community, but I'm just curious about the distinction and what 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 the what eventually pops out of the hopper, if you will. Will it be just just totally different in your mind, or what? what? Well, yeah, I think so. I think you need to understand this is a huge piece of property. So, yeah. Um, and when you're when you're talking about kind of laying out or planning for that property, you have to really understand it in the context of the larger area. So how will it be integrated with the surrounding neighborhoods? And more importantly, how we should be thinking about that whole area in terms of the opportunities that are likely to come online. So for example, Reed Hillview, Reed Hillview Airport is anticipated mm -hmm. to close mm -hmm. and that is likely to redevelop. When that goes, that opens up a lot more land for redevelopment, including potentially the East Ridge Mall or portions of the East Ridge Mall. Mm -hmm. so so I think not that we want to would recommend doing a specific plan for all that area. I think it's a little premature, but at least planning for the Pleasant Hill Golf Course in the context of all these opportunities, understanding that the infrastructure that's needed, maybe start thinking about, well, how would we pay for all this infrastructure, you know, down the road to, to allow for all this development. So, and it, it takes more of a focus of what, you know, talking about the city needs, the community needs, and how it'd be integrated in that larger community. So that's, that's the the process we're talking about. Why we think it be uh, should be city led. If it's and you, don't, and, you, and you don't and you don't think that uh, having a process that's you know led by a developer but that has city involvement wouldn't result in the same thing. Or well, so I think the the focus is more on that individual property and what the developer is actually proposing to the property without sort of the the context of how it fits in a larger area. So. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, so I think, you know, there, there's a different perspective there, a different focus that's being driven yeah. by the developer's proposal. Yeah, um, I understand, okay. And, and do you, um, you know, looking at two tracks, right? A city-led process and a developer-led process, what, what would you say are differences in the timeline? Do, should we expect that the city, I mean, what I'm afraid is that the city-led process is gonna take years upon years to complete. <laughs> and development led process may, may be a little quicker. And I think that land, I think uh, Matthew Reed said it well that, you know, sure. that land, you know, vacant for years and years and years, and it really is an opportunity to do something with it. And I'd, I'd yeah, hate well. to wait for the city to, to, you know, spend years and years studying the heck out of something and then never doing anything. Um, so yeah. what, what would you say is the timeline for the Yeah, I mean, the GPA that was submitted now, um, depending on what the council does tonight, I mean, that process could be a year and a half-ish for that whole, you know, process to play out. A city-led process would um, probably take about a year, year and a half as well. But frankly, the issue is, so we do have a position available to work on this um, come next year early next year, um, we're filling that, we're going through recruitment to fill that position now. And then we would have to do a budget request for funding. So the issue is when will we have the funding to actually do the work, uh, but we uh, would have, it would probably take about 12 months to two year and a half to do the process if it was a public process. I mean, it, honestly, it may take a little bit longer. I don't think it would take a lot longer, but it's a question of what is the right thing to do, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm going to wait to hear a little bit more from some of my colleagues, but uh, thank you for, for entertaining my questions. I appreciate it.
Thank you, Councilor Jimenez. Other questions? Um, probably not a secret that um, I'm not supportive of the recommend of the of the motion on the floor. Um, and my concerns are twofold. One is uh, this distinction between city-led and developer-led process. And certainly, Michael, I think, described there's a big, big difference in scope. And if we're looking at development of multiple different parcels in the area, um, you're able to do things more holistically, look at things like infrastructure and roads and, um, and traffic in a way uh, that enables you to find solutions that benefit the community and engage the community uh, in those larger solutions. Uh, on the other hand, a developer-led process is obviously going to focus on the one parcel the developer cares about, uh, and that's going to be exclusive of that kind of planning. Um, we generally don't like to do uh, piecemeal planning in this city. We like to do more comprehensive planning because it produces better outcomes. Um, it also goes without saying, uh, regardless of, of whatever respect or esteem we might have for the particular developer, the reality is uh, we are all biased human beings. Uh, and any process that's led by someone who has a natural financial interest in the outcome is likely to be a process that is going to differ in some way from a process that is led by a public agency that is responsible first and foremost to the public. Um, if we didn't believe that, I'm not sure we'd all be serving, uh, that, that there was a difference in the processes. You could imagine if we decided that a whole host of other processes should be led simply by private sector uh, entities. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, we just went through an extensive process in Deardon West which I don't think this would need anywhere near that extensive a process because that was, after all, the largest private sector development in our city's history. So that's a, that's a pretty big one. But can we imagine how the community would have perceived it if Google was leading that effort? Uh, how, whether or not we'd ever get buy-in from the community, whether or not we'd ever get to a result uh, that would enable us to move forward. Um, I, I don't think we would because I just don't think uh, there's going to be a lot of trust, and I think you heard concerns from a lot of folks in the community about that because in our city, traditionally, these processes, and I think most other cities, uh, these processes are, are led by city staff. Uh, secondly, I'm concerned that we're not even able to identify any minimal amount of affordable housing uh, that anybody would be subjected to for essentially violating the rules, right? For saying that we're going to allow them to build in areas that are unmigatable, <laughs> that, that are the greenhouse gas emissions, the VMT, cannot be mitigated, areas that are not even in our city limits, right? This is in the case in this particular parcel. It's an unincorporated county land, uh, areas that are far enough from the center parts of our city where we have transit and other infrastructure, although there is light rail uh, not too far away, but clearly, obviously, with not the ridership that would enable a reduction in VMT or sufficient reduction in VMT. So, you know, the question really becomes, if we're going to allow someone to essentially do something that's completely contrary to a climate smart plan, which we all unanimously approved as a council, uh, and contrary to our general plan, which defines the areas that we're going to promote growth in our city, also unanimously approved by our council, with an extensive amount of public input in both of those plans, if someone's going to violate that, there ought to be really substantial public benefit, and we should not hesitate from setting a high bar around things like affordable housing. And speaking of affordable housing, uh, Michael, I'd like to go to this chart that's presented in the memorandum uh, from, from my colleagues, um, uh, Councilmember Davis and Councilmember Perales, describing RENA results and, and permitted units. Uh, my understanding of what you said was that, uh, for the most part, we're not struggling to actually permit market rate units in terms of arena allocations, where we fall very, very short is in affordable units. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, so if that's what we need, if that's the real challenge, and I think we all know, because we all see the desperate need for affordable housing in our community, then why aren't we mandating more affordable housing? Why are we saying, go ahead and build whatever market rate housing you want in these parcels? Uh, why would we shy away from that? 
So I, I am concerned because these exceptions that are being proposed are really driven by developers who are focused on one very large parcel. Um, and, you know, I, I take the comments of, of folks like Wesley Lee, who I know is a neighborhood leader out in District 8, who's very familiar with this, as many of other community leaders are out there, um, that this starts to feel an awful lot like the process that we encountered uh, with measures B and C back in 2018. Uh, and I can tell you, if, if we cut corners on process and we decide that we're going to essentially allow these kinds of exceptions uh, by essentially developer-led efforts, uh, there will be pushback. And I'm pretty confident it's going to get harder, not easier. <laughs> the people have a right of referendum. There are also lawsuits. There's lots of other things that happen that make efforts like this a lot more costly and take a lot more time. In my experience, we do better when we go slow and we follow the rules rather than going fast and skipping by them. So that's why I'm suggesting, and you don't have to adopt my memo, it's fine. I'd be happy just to take staff's recommendation. I, uh, I really crafted my memo around what I thought staff was more or less recommending at T&E, uh, but I'm, I'm not really partial about that. Uh, I just think that we ought to be demanding a lot if folks are going to essentially decide they're going to build wherever they want, regardless of our general plan, regardless of our climate smart plan, and they're going to build how they want. Uh, we have a right as a council to demand much more, and I think our residents, most importantly, demand and expect that we'll demand more. Uh, Councilmember Mahan. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I'm finding this to be a difficult one. I, I usually come to the meeting having a pretty good idea of where I am on an issue, but I have to admit, I, I have um, still kind of on the fence on this. I want to lay out a few thoughts. Uh, what, one is, you know, I, I will say that I, I would caution us against us thinking that we're doing just fine on market rate for a few reasons. One is, um, last time I checked, I think we're entitling significantly more market rate than we're actually building and having people occupy. And so I, I, I'm not sure that it's actually true that, that we're hitting our goals. Um, second, I know market rate housing in most areas of our city directly helps fund affordable housing. So outside of the downtown high rise exemption, uh, more market rate housing opens up more funding uh, or more opportunities for affordable housing. And then finally, in a situation where we have such a lack of supply, I, I really I've made this point many times from the dais, but I, I really believe that we should not be pitting market rate and affordable against one another as one being significantly better than the other in the sense that every person who's housed through a new unit is not going downstream and bidding up the price of naturally affordable housing. I mean, it is a math problem. We have more people and more jobs than we have housing. So, I, I mean, just count me in the camp of saying we should be overbuilding market rate if we can because we have a significant supply issue. So I just, I, I wanna just make that point on the other hand, I think the mayor makes really good arguments for, and I think staff uh, has made good arguments for retaining a city-led public process. So what I, what I wanna try to do, at least with my questions here, because I don't know what the answer is, is that I think council members uh, Davis and Perales have, have hit on something that has concerned me, which is that we often let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We often set requirements that are well-intended and processes that are well-intended and yet block out investment. And I personally, even if we're just talking about that one site of the golf course, I don't wanna see it just sit empty for another 10 years. When we have a housing crisis, when we have an east side that deserves amenities, when there's a lot of great productive use and, and tax base that could be generated with that space. So that's why I find myself kind of stuck here because I wanna see us develop. I don't wanna see us implement policies and requirements that are so strict that we crowd, we, we scare away investment and don't get the investment that we need. I do think as a principle though that I would like to see the process be city-led. And so I, I don't know if there's a compromise position we can work out on the dais here, but I suspect, and maybe I'll start, or I'll move to a question for council members Perales or, and or Davis. Um, Underlying the concern here, I assume, has to do with the current deficiencies of the, the community engagement process. 
that it's too slow, that it starts too late, that it, it has too many hurdles to jump through. And I'm just curious, I know you all have spent a lot of time thinking about this through TNE. It's a committee I don't sit on. Are there other changes or reforms that we could make or, or a tweaking of the city-led community process that would address some of the concerns around just not getting the investment that I think we all want to see? Is that for, for uh, either? I, I, well, I was starting with you or Councilmember Davis, just because you, you all brought forward the memo with the recommendations that, that's the motion on the floor. And I know have thought about this a lot. And I, I suspect that, you know, you've hit on some real barriers that developers have, have mentioned that is preventing us from getting the kind of investment that we want to see. So I'm sure there's a real issue here. I just want to know if there are alternative ways of solving for them that might preserve a city led process. Yeah, I actually think it's fairly simple. Um, and Michael uh, alluded to it. It's staffing, right? It's capacity. Um, and and quite frankly, we have not had the capacity in our planning teams, uh, in our planning team, to go out and, and be extremely proactive. Uh, we actually haven't even had the staffing, as we all know, to be reactive uh, in a timely manner. Uh, you just look towards you know recent history with how long it's taken through the urban village processes and how slow we've moved there um, i have specific examples one for instance the uh, um, martha's gardens neighborhood now that is a specific plan but it's a very small small area of district three just south of 280 um, that that i had an interest from from the community there and and ultimately uh, have been advocating to try and and right and get that uh, led through staff right to to have that re envision, uh, and that's taken years and years even to just begin a process. Uh, I couldn't imagine right if we were to outside of this whole discussion, let's say an independent memo came forward from the DA council member that said, hey, I'd like to to ask staff to do a community or excuse me a a city led um, process on the former Pleasant Hills golf course. I could imagine the process that would go through. Number one, it would be referred to priority setting. Number two, staff would come forward and say, like Michael just said, we need staff, right? We need staff to do it. We need city, we need you got you all, the city council to allocate funding during the budget process. And I can guarantee you what that looks like. That looks like several years in the making simply to get something started. Uh, right. I, it, so I think that's the, you know, again, it boils down to just, I think the, the um, capacity. Yeah, and I share that concern, and, and I wonder, maybe I'll also direct the question to staff to weigh in on things we might do, but I'll, but I'll just caution, if the answer is, well, we just need staffing and we don't have staffing, I, I, it's not a great answer, because I, I don't think it's right to have opportunities sit there and then processes take years and then developers walk away and we see other places get investment and growth and we continue to have a lack of housing and a lack of tax base. And, and there's a real hidden cost there that, that isn't always so easy to quantify. I'm also curious if maybe there's an FDA-like approach here where if a certain threshold is, is surpassed, where we're just too slow and in our own way, then we start to open up the uh, process to the developer and actually we lose some of the control because we just took too long on our end. I, I think there, there does have to, have to be a way to accelerate these processes, but I'm curious from a staff perspective, are there things we can do preserving a city-led community engagement process that would address some of this concern that Councilmember Peral has just raised around? This could take two, three, four years to ever prioritize. Yeah, so we have a vacant senior planner position right now um, that we, and we have a number of them, but we have one that we would, um, this, project would this, this project would go to if the council decides to go that route and do a city-led process. We are actually um, actively recruiting right now. We're going to be set, we're setting up interviews for to fill this position and other positions um, over the next coming weeks, and we anticipate that those positions would be filled if all goes well in probably end of January, early February. Uh, it's true we would need um, a council allocate uh, money for this. Our approach would be though to hire a consultant. I think it's really good to have an objective third party leading a process like this. So. The, the staff person that we would have would be managing the consultant and working with the consultant on the engagement process. The process itself is not intended to be an urban village plan process or a specific plan process. That's way too in depth. We, it's much more of a community input, guiding principles um, approach, understanding sort of um, the over larger goals, understanding the infrastructure needs that are needed and how all this stuff will fit together. So it, it's an, it would, in, in our mind, to be a higher level process like that, not 
a plan where you define where the streets go and what land uses go to there. That That's a little more in depth. I think it's really trying to understand how all the things generally fit together, the amenities and the infrastructure that would be needed for a, a given amount of, of development and what type of, what type of development it would be. If council member were to, I'm just thinking off the cuff here, I'm really trying to find out if there's a middle path because there are some um, competing values here and I feel very torn. On, on the one hand, I agree with the core principle I think the mayor laid out that uh, these complex land use issues are in the public realm and deserve a public uh, process. On the other hand, I hear over and over again frustration and horror stories from investors and developers and folks who want to build housing, bring jobs, build our tax base, and from start to finish, the process is two, three, four years, they walk away. I hear those stories frequently. So. It, you know, one approach is if a council member were to say, this is a project I'd like to see prioritized in my district and we can't get around to the process on our end because of lack of staffing or whatever other reason after X number of months or a year or whatever that threshold is, do we start removing some of the requirements? I mean, is that is that an approach? I think that's kind of like the FDA model I'm, I'm uh, suggesting, right? The, the drug gets approved if they take more than 18 months, right? I mean, it's, there, there's got to be some middle ground here. Some accountability, I guess, is what I'm looking for. <laughs> Council Member Chris Burton, Director of Planning, Building Code Enforcement. I um, think it's certainly something we could uh, look into and explore more to provide Council that feedback. I think probably the, uh, the recent examples we've seen relate to the way that the state has imposed new requirements around housing development throughout the city. And while you know, there is certainly opportunity for streamlining process, it has created significant conflict with many of the neighborhoods of the surrounding uses um, through that streamlined, streamlined process where we're sort of avoiding kind of traditional uh, best practices for, for good land use planning. So th there's certainly some aspect to that that we should be looking at, but there, there's certainly a, a number of concerns that come with it. I think the other point I wanna make and there's a couple of pieces here um, relative to staffing. So uh, as a department, obviously, you know, we suffer as, as many others do uh, with the current challenges to hire. Um, we're actively recruiting across the board. Um, actually, our planning staff, uh, we've seen more success in recruitments uh, than in other parts of the department, and, and we're progressing, as Michael said, uh, in the near term on those. I'll remind council that we just brought last week our peak staffing contracts to expand our capacity of the number of firms and the availability of contract staff that we can bring on quickly as well. Um, and so staffing from a hiring perspective, we believe you know, we have the opportunity to resolve this. That's separate and apart when we talk about a resource constraint um, and the availability of positions to do the work, which has quite often been the challenge around how we've proceeded with urban villages. So as we've discussed previously, um, you know, much of the urban village development throughout the city has relied on grant processes to provide us the funding to hire that staff. So I just wanna make that, that change, or make that distinction between the two different parts. We believe that we have a handle on hiring. We believe that we have an active position that we can use for this work. Um, there is additional resources that we would bring through a budget process. Um, but, but, you know, I just want to make that additional clarification so that we all have the same understanding. Yeah, and look, I want to do everything I can to support you in filling vacancies and having that capacity, which is why I talk so much about focus. Uh, I'm, I'm not inclined to turn the process over to a private developer. On the other hand, I don't think it's right for us to create complex requirements and processes and set the bar up here so high that we can't resource the implementation and then we make it really hard for investors and developers and small business owners and everybody else to engage and invest and thrive in our city. And then it's kind of like, well, we just need to eventually get to hiring the roles that we need and having the capacity that we need to implement our own rules. Maybe the rules and the complexity of what we're trying to do or the number of things we're trying to do is the root cause. So I just, I, I'm not inclined to turn this over to the developer, but we gotta take a long, hard look in the mirror just based on the horror stories I hear over and over again from people who want to invest in our city. So I, I, don't, I don't have a great answer, but could, hopefully I gave my colleagues some thoughts and I'll, I'll pause could, there. Could I offer just one suggestion, Councilman Mahan? If, if I could, with a question. On existing parcels that are already, already designated for housing, in our general plan uh, that we have to submit regularly for, to satisfy the housing element. How many units can be built without any general plan amendment, without 
changing any of the rules. Yeah, so the capacity of the general plan is 120,000 units. Now, mind you, that's the capacity as of 2011. So some of the units have been built, but okay. that's that's the overall capacity. Okay, but what about plan. our housing element that we submit where nobody's got to change the general plan? 62,000 units. 62,000 units. Yeah. Okay. So any developer on any given day can go build on on a whole variety, hundreds of parcels out there in our city and build 62,000 units without any process relating, even resembling a general plan amendment. Well, correct. So right now um, in our housing elements, 35,000 units, the one we have now, the draft housing element that'll be coming to council next year, the reading number is 62,000 housing units and we've identified right. sites for all 62,000 housing units. Okay. So the way anybody can invest or build in our city is to build on any of those hundreds, maybe thousands, I don't know, probably hundreds of uh, parcels, where you can go build 62,000 units of housing. Where you gotta go through a lot of process and pain and suffering is where you decide you're gonna go outside the rules, outside the general plan, outside the climate smart plan, outside the community expectations. Then you got a process. And the whole point is we're trying to encourage people to build the housing where we've all agreed we want the housing. Now the problem is we know for some developers, they look at the, the cost of those parcels and the price is higher than it is to build on parcels that might be zoned industrial or maybe open space because guess what? They're not on the market. People can't build housing on them so they don't have the same price. So the question is, are we gonna facilitate essentially zoning arbitrage by some developers who wanna find cheaper parcels? Or are we gonna try to direct developers to build where the community in the city says they want development? There's a way to build easily in this city. It means you build on any of those hundreds of parcels and you follow the rules. Uh, Councilmember Cohen? Yeah, thank you. Um, like Councilmember Mahan, I came in totally open actually on, on all of this. I, I didn't come in with a preconceived outcome or um, belief that, I, I, that there was a right answer to this. Um, I did vote at T&E um, as part of the group that approved those recommendations. I, I share some of Councilmember Jimenez's frustrations about the process after that, but set that aside for now. Um, I, I'm not, first of all, I just want to say I'm not sure I see how some of the things that the mayor is saying in his memo and some of the things in the Davis Perales memo are mutually exclusive. I, I think that they're, that, that both can be true and both can be adopted in some way. I mean, I don't, the, the general, the general nature of what was in the T&E recommendation was for any site that comes up there, these are things we should consider, a future council should consider. And I, I, don't, I don't necessarily know what's completely objectionable about that. I mean, it, it may signal that we're open to change, but it doesn't change anything. We still would have to go through the general plan amendment process on any of those sites. It's not like putting it into this VMT policy changes the general plan. So it, it just says, hey, if we're gonna do that in the future, here are some parameters we think you should follow. And I think that that's logical. Separate from that is the question of what process should be followed on a specific site. I actually wasn't sure that the specific site should be called out as part of this plan. This plan to me was more general, but you know, the, the mayor in your memo, you've called out a specific process for this site. And if we want to proceed that way, I'm, I mean, I'm okay. I'm open to discussing proceeding that way as well. So I, I guess I want to, I'm trying to understand why this conflict seems to be happening because I'm not sure that stuff is so much in conflict. I, I don't know how you used and over there wants to <laughs> weigh in on what, how you see it. Yeah, I mean, I think, the, I mean, just throwing it out there, the council could move uh, the mayor from Perales and Deb Davis and I think the mayor's memo. I mean, I think you, you, you could do both. I mean, there could be a criteria for an override and then the council could say, however, we think that there should be a community led a city led process to plan for this area that they don't have to be mutually exclusive i'm just throwing that out there yeah so i, I mean that to me that's the <laughs> that's potentially the compromise there might be a few things we have to tweak to make sure that everything fits together clearly there was a yep. difference in the recommendation in t and e on an affordable housing although there was an affordable housing recommendation as part of that it just may not have been quite as at the same level as the one you put in your memo but we can have that discussion about what the right level is or whether there should be a right level. I mean, in my mind, what TNE was saying is consider these parameters, community benefit, open space, affordable housing, when the decision is made to override VMT in the context of changing a general plan. That to me is really all that the TNE, I mean, maybe you see it more than that, but I feel like that's kind of what TNE was pushing for and what the memo 
from Perales and uh, Councilman Perales and Davis were, were pushing for. So I just want to start there. Um, I, I guess I want to ask, I mean, I know that you're, as, as, a, as staff, you had recommended not adopting the T&E's recommendation. What is the practical difference between adopting it or not adopting it in terms of what would happen going forward on any individual site? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the key differences, I think, were one about having setting some expectation on affordability. I think, and that's, and the, the other key difference, frankly, was the process itself. So I think, again, we're recommending more, a city-led process. I mean, let's be honest here, a, a vacant golf course in Evergreen is probably not gonna say, get, say a vacant golf course forever, right? I mean, so it's more about what should the process be to have a conversation to lead to redevelopment of that golf course? And I think a key difference is that we're recommending a city-led process that we talked about. The T&E recommendation doesn't, um, doesn't require that um, or doesn't, um, yeah, it's not part of that recommendation. But it doesn't necessarily preclude that, right? It, I mean, it doesn't preclude it, just, it, right? So that, that's why, you know, there's an opportunity to do both. They're not mutually exclusive, but it wasn't included yeah, in that recommendation. It wasn't included, it wasn't spelled out, but it didn't necessarily specify any process. It just said, if the council considers making a change, correct, you should consider these things. Right. And, and, and then as far as I'm concerned, we would discuss the process. Let me, let me follow up a little bit on Councilmember Mayhan's uh, questions about the process itself, the city-led versus developer-led. And I, I mean, I understand the distinction about the city-led being more, in theory, more transparent and more objective. I guess what I would ask is, is there a way for us to come back to council with a recommendation of what a developer-led process could look like that would meet the expectations that we get from a city-led process? Because if it's a question of resources, a developer-led process, in theory, is then funded and has resources that come with it that we could take advantage of and make sure, as long as we make sure that certain elements of our process are specified, so they have to meet certain things, could we not say, You're, we would hire a consultant to do it, you have to hire a consultant to do it in the same way and you have to meet these specific recommendations? Yeah, I mean, I mean, so, I mean, we've, we've done this before with mixed results where um, the developer has paid for a consultant. Um, it's let, the city actually manages the consultant. I mean, so I think that's probably preferable than the, consult, the, the developer hiring consultant that works for the developer. Again, it's really about what is the developer interest in moving their development forward and not stepping back and looking at like a citywide perspective. So, but we have, we did it in Coyote Fret Valley, for example, where the developers um, actually paid, um, paid for the consultant team that reported to staff. So that has been done before with mixed results. And council member, I'll just add to that. So as Michael said, it, it, it has been done previously, but um, in, in those instances, it's usually with a, a collection of property owners over multiple sites, rather than an individual property owner that's focused exclusively on, on their site. And what that affords us is the, the opportunity to consider capacity within the area, right? And we do believe, right, that there's an opportunity here to really envision what future development, um, you know, in, in this part of the city would look like. Like, um, but it needs to involve those multiple sites because otherwise we're limiting our, our potential future opportunity um, as Reed Hill View converts, as that opens up other development opportunities on Eastridge as well. Um, and so, you know, to, to consider that bigger process, you'd be asking the single developer to then take on that, that larger responsibility. Well, so that's it seemed to be arguing against the mayor's proposal to do the even the city led process on the site because it would be. No, I think we're, what we're saying is if it's a city-led process, we would recommend having a larger conversation about the Pleasant Hill Golf Course site in the context of other likely redevelopment opportunities in the area. If it's a developer-led process, I think, you know, again, the focus is much more on their property and their, their proposal and their needs. I guess I don't read that in the recommendation in this memo. I mean, I understand that that's what you'd be envisioning, but I, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess I'll let the mayor... Well, if it's city-led, city staff... We would know. determine what the parameters are yeah, of the study. I mean, I guess I understand that. Yeah, I'm not going to micromanage that one. Right, right. Okay, so, so I guess I'm thinking more generally again, because it feels like we're focusing so much on a specific site when we're on, a, on a general policy. <laughs> and I guess what I'm trying to think of is if, this, if there's a conflict between, between the idea of city-led but expedited timelines, 
maybe a recommendation would be to come back with a recommended process by which we could meet somewhere in the middle and improve timelines for a developer, but not sacrifice the, the goals that we would want out of a process. That, I guess that's all I'm asking for, is whether we can come back with that, with some kind of recommendation of, a, of how the process would look. All right, so, I mean, I don't know if that, if that would, is that ex something you think is acceptable? It's certainly something that we can bring back, council okay. member, for a subsequent discussion with council. Yeah, obviously we'd need to sort of look into what that looks like, where we can look for efficiencies, and provide a, a more, sort of a clearer, plan on, on what that outreach, that engagement looks like, um, and, and then we bring that back to council for further discussion. I mean, I, I could make a, general, a, a, a request for a friendly amendment on this, but I also want to hear from other colleagues about what they think about the idea. But I, I feel like there's somewhere in between in all this that we can come to that would be a, a good compromise. Thank you. Uh, council Member Arenas? Uh, thank you. Um, so I've been listening to this discussion, um, and I'm wondering why my district is, um, so highlighted, um, rather than, or have us focus on this, uh, general policy. Um, and I'm not sure if it's a, uh, I don't know what's happening here. I don't know if it, there's some personal feelings here, but. Um, I really want to take a step back and look at what could potentially happen to my district and will soon to be um, someone else's district um, as of the first. When we haven't considered when light rail extension comes into um, the picture, this VMT will look different, correct, Michael? So VMT, the numbers get updated in the maps per modeling and real world uh, uh, calibration um, every two to three years. So these numbers don't get are not stuck. Um, and in fact, we're updating them right now and new numbers will be released um, uh, to, for right. developers use um, come late January. Right, yeah, so, so if, if these, these numbers get, um, don't get stuck, but our processes do, um, I'm not sure that it, it's really any different anyways, um, because as we've seen time and time again, our processes um, create many, many obstacles. Um, when I first started, uh, I walked into um, a whole, um, a, a big mess in my district where our community was left out of a discussion around the development of some acreage at Evergreen College. And my, um, my goal was to bring that, the voices of our community into that process and to make sure that that developer heard uh, those, those voices and, and that um, they were assured a, a part in, um, in that development. Um, it's not any different, I'm not in a different place. I absolutely um, want to make sure that my community continues to um, have a voice. Um, but sometimes there's things that happen that are going to cut our and shut our voices out of a process. And I just want to remind everyone that there is a, there was a, uh, a bill um, and I forget what number it was, but this is uh, the Cortezi bill that would have essentially taken um, this piece of property that um, we, we seem to be over-focused on. Um, and it's not the only piece of property in uh, D8 that has a lot of potential. Um, we have Eastridge with a sea of parking and we just heard earlier how we are going to mitigate uh, parking so that we um, encourage a walkable um, community. And I wanna see that for our Eastridge um, area as well. We have a sea of parking, but we can't develop 
um, and we can't grow it and we can't have outdoor seating for our restaurants. So we can't have uh, al fresco out there because of um, the FAA and the rules that um, guide the airport. And so we, we can't, we can't really see any, any development in some of the areas that have so much potential. Um, but like I was saying, the, there is a bill that um, Senator Cortezi uh, developed. It, it didn't go through. Michael, did, were you involved in any way? Um, was the planning department ever connected, contacted, consulted about this bill? No, we were not. We we found out about it kind of at the end of the legislative process and and inquired about it, but we, we were not contacted about it proactively by the author, Cortez's office. Right. Yeah, and, and it was a real shame because I think we we have a, a better relationship uh, with um, Senator Cortez um, than uh, than that. Um, but it really uh, stressed to me um, that we might not have a voice if the state decides differently for us. And this would have um, allowed the county to approve and and annex this piece of property um, and any like it um, and streamline it without any city um, say. And so for me, it, it, this is not about a developer. This is about making sure that my community ha continues to have a voice. Um, and I know that there are um, processes that the future council can um, ensure to have. And this is what uh, council member uh, Cohen, you were uh, referring to. Um, we, we are still in control of the processes. We're still in control of approvals. Um, if we don't have the capacity to give attention to the east side in a way that is meaningful, um, and I'm not talking about um, any one particular parcel, I'm just talking about the east side. And the east side in my district um, uh, around Tully and Capitol Expressway has been overlooked for a really long time. We are not gonna get prioritized. It's just not going to happen when there's so much happening in the downtown, in North San Jose, on the west side, uh, we will continue to be at the bottom of the list. And so when I uh, see that there's an opportunity um, for us to take advantage, um, I think that we should explore it. I'm not saying that let's, let's give the reins away to, to somebody outside of our city government and I think you all know how strongly I feel as a public servant um, to ensure that we serve our community well. Um, but because this the, so many of, of my colleagues have already mentioned Pleasant Hills, I'm, I'm going to talk about that just for a second. Pleasant Hills um, golf course or former golf course is um, a parcel that has had a lot of proposals and I have over the years have said no to many of those proposals simply because we couldn't build um, and we couldn't have that possibility there. Um, I, I want to make sure that my district has vibrancy, that we also have a walkable community, that, it, that it's not just um, other parts of our city and um, you know, the, the Almadens or the Willow Glens or the any of the other ones, uh, Santana Row um, areas that deserve walkable neighborhoods are, um, my community deserves walkable neighborhoods just as well. But we need to have a priority and I just don't see that our staff has the capacity to deliver. And so this is when I think you, you need to disrupt some of the process and, um, and take a chance on some of the folks who are providing some of this change in our community. And these are not just um, 
any old folks. These are folks who've been in our community for a really long time. These are folks who have um, created a whole institute called the Urban Vibrancy Institute. And this is to bring different leaders, a myriad of leaders together uh, so that they can um, provide some of that support and vibrancy and safety and uh, cleanliness and collaboration in the downtown area. The city isn't asking this group of developers to do this. They've done this on their own. Uh, they've been meeting for, I think, for, for a year and a half. And, and the only reason that I think that they're, um, they're, uh, there's a level of trustworthiness to them is that they are showing how much they are willing uh, to take on themselves and to um, not own the process themselves, but to have our community own it. They're not afraid to let folks in. Um, there's a whole learning um, uh, segment of this. And, um, and because of that, I, I feel that there is a, I'm, I'm more confident in who these people are. And so, so that's what I'll say about Pleasant Hills, but I, I, you know, whatever my colleagues decide, whatever we all decide, um, I, I'll, I'll be supportive of, of any motion that, that um, encourages vibrancy and development and um, certainly community participation in my community. So at this point, I, um, I hope that, that we can maybe find some, some middle ground um, here on the dais. I know that uh, Council Member Cohen, you've asked about bringing a, a process forward that could help define um, what the the developer might be able to, um, uh, I don't know if it's a template or um, a certain guide, but I think that this is an opportunity for us to take a look at um, a different uh, concept. And simply because the city staff isn't leading it does not mean that it's the wrong process because we as council will continue to have control over what gets approved and how projects get done. We don't ever lose control over that. Um, and this is certainly not uh, an, an attempt to do that, but, but um, I, I apologize that I'm focusing so much on Pleasant Hills because it's not, it's not supposed to be about Pleasant Hills. It's supposed to be about VMT and it's supposed to be about having these exceptions. And we just heard earlier in our meeting that uh, the siting policy highlights my district as an area where we don't have affordable housing. Um, but now we're going to create uh, an obstacle by not having any flexibility and any exceptions to VMT. So um, I, I hope that we can we can come to some some sort of conclusion here that will allow us to explore something different. Thank you, Councilmember uh, Councilmember Perales. Yeah, thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. Um, and I just wanted to, to speak to a couple of the comments that uh, have been stated and hopefully we can be able to land this ship here. Uh, in the memo from myself and Councilmember Davis, uh, in our recommendation to, we specifically, again, mentioned uh, conducting extensive community outreach. Uh, we also mentioned in all prominent languages of any proposed project area. Again, we also were speaking uh, in general, because this is a citywide policy and one that uh, could be um, applied many places throughout the city. There may be an opportunity at the former Pleasant Hills Golf Course, um, but I would agree with Councilman Rodenas, um, that really is not the focus and should not be the focus. It was not um, my focus. It was really trying to figure out a broad policy, something that could work citywide. Uh, and that's what we're attempting to do here. Um, and uh, we did state uh, consistent with the projects of significant community interest under our own public outreach council policy 6-30. I'll uh, refer my colleagues to that, but 
um, in there, it specifically states in regards to working in consultation with the council offices um, of the council district, uh, where that applicant um, and the proposal may be. Um, I think that is, is sort of uh, almost a given, right? I think we, we, we deal with this all the time as council representatives where we have project proposals within our district uh, districts and uh, we work very closely on them, whether they are projects that are privately proposed or whether it's working with staff, as I mentioned earlier, as I have on areas like uh, wanting the Martha's Garden specific plan to be updated, um, right? We work very closely um, if it's a community-led or, or, or a city-led or a privately-led process. Uh, and that should be a given. The other thing I would say is that, um, Councilmember Cohen, you were mentioning about the, the memo uh, from my, myself and uh, Councilor Davis um, and what was approved, the direction out of t &E, did not exclude a, uh, a city-led process. I, I would agree with that, right? That, that our memo, our direction is, is sort of the all-inclusive direction. Uh, it doesn't say you couldn't be uh, a city-led process, but it doesn't specify that it has to be a city-led process. That's the difference. Uh, and the challenge that I have with the, the staff recommendation and the mayor's recommendation that are essentially saying that is it. It's one and done. It has to be a city-led process. And I will reiterate why I, I don't support that. I, I don't think that we will find the staff capacity um, in a timely manner to be able to do that. I, again, I've seen it on a small scale. I couldn't imagine on a much larger scale. Um, it, this is incumbent on a lot of things. Once again, going to the council, looking for uh, prioritizing this, prioritizing the funding, prioritizing the staff, uh, as you've already heard from, from, from city staff, uh, hiring the staff, right, that we don't have today, as we know we have a ton of vacancies. Um, if we can do this outside of um, all of those con constraints and still achieve a tremendous amount of community involvement in something that was robust and uh, extensive and involved the council office, I don't understand why we wouldn't want to, to do that. And, and again, our direction allows us to go both paths. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I am completely confident in uh, the ability of the council office. It's, I know it, it you know, um, for this particular uh, parcel that we've been discussing tonight, uh, that it's not on the agenda. Um, I would have confidence in Councilmember Arenas, but I have confidence in all my colleagues here that if such a project were to be proposed within their district, uh, that they would lead a robust process as well and participate again, regardless of, of, of who was, was at the helm or the wheel, if it was uh, city-led or, or privately-led. Um, and clearly, if it's a project uh, of, of some controversy, uh, it's going to, to take a lot more engagement. And I, I imagine the council office, as well as the, the developer, would know that. And so I'm, I'm comfortable with the, the direction as is. I don't believe we need to kick the can on that discussion, uh, I, I believe our memo from myself, Councilor Davis, is all encompassing. It includes both both pathways. If if staff were to lead a process, and uh, or the council member for a particular district was to say, "Hey, I want to lead a process on a particular parcel," uh, great. Then that you know, then that would qualify uh, under under what our requirements are. But again, it's it's not that that is the only way that we could go forward. I think that would kill a project. Um, and many projects, as Councilor Mahan has stated, uh, due to, to simply dying on the vine. Um, I also think, and this is why I, I was not in favor of the restrictions of, for instance, in the mayor's memo of 45 to 50%, or even the staff memo of 35% affordability threshold. I think if we are too prescriptive up front, we also kill any potential opportunities to even have a discussion. Uh, I was uh, one of the, the, the vocal advocates that led the opportunity of getting a 25% minimum for the Google project. So I'm, I'm not against it clearly. And I've, I've led for the last eight years on developing affordable housing, but I also am being realistic in how we can be less prescriptive and rather a little bit more broad in our direction. And, and that's why we were utilizing language around RENA goals and, and we, which clearly includes affordable housing, uh, but not necessarily trying to kill a project either on the vine uh, through delay or through being too prescriptive upfront. That's why uh, I'm, I'm hoping my colleagues will support the motion as is, and um, and I'll, I'll I'll rest now. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Cohen. Yes, and um, I, I apologize to my colleague, Councilmember Perales, for what I'm about to say because I know that uh, 
I, you know, I don't have a problem necessarily with your memo, but I, I'm starting to have a feeling tonight that there's a lot of work to be done still to come up with the proper solution um, and the proper set of recommendations. Um, and I think that we should give it a little time to do that. So um, what I'd like to see, I, I suspect that the final result should be some amalgam of what's being discussed tonight as opposed to um, you know, one memo or the other, or, or you know, or or a quickly thought up combination of those things, and that's what concerns me. I I don't like. Sometimes I enjoy the process of making sausage here on the dais, but sometimes it makes more sense to be thoughtful and come back at a later time. Um, and I think this is one of those times because this is a complicated policy, and I don't want to feel like well we're rushed because of time to do something that may not make complete sense. So what I'm going to recommend is a a substitute motion at this time to accept the staff recommendation, but bring back to council the discussion, re-agendize the discussion of the additional memos for a future council meeting um, with recommendations on some, some of the details of what kinds of parameters should be set around these exceptions into the to the uh, policy, um, and also bring back to council a proposal around what we talked, what I talked about before, a community engagement process that can be a hybrid of a developer-led and city-led process that will allow for expediting the process, but still be guided by very clear guidelines so that we're not sacrificing the things that we want out of a city-led process. And also, I should include Sergio, uh, Council Member Jimenez's memo in this as well. I think that was pretty pretty clear. Does that, okay. does that motion make sense? So uh, yeah, the, the second part definitely does. The first part, just to confirm, so it's to come back to have a conversation about the appropriate path forward for um, general plan amendments that needed to override in these in these situations where the land is private rec or i just want to clear up can you clarify um that? I, <laughs> or i guess i should say what we whatever the <laughs> the, the, the memo that came out of t and e was for the specific of private rec sites right correct so then that conversation will continue at a future date i see okay because because i just don't want to necessarily accept some recommendations that turn out later that if we had just thought it through more it would be you know we might take a mix of certain certain recommendations so i i i'm recommending bringing that back not not dismissing them but bringing them back and having that conversation in a more thorough manner after staff's had a chance to tell us not that you don't want the recommendation but what the recommendation might be look like but and then that other piece that we added about how we could redefine the process so that a developer could lead a process, but that it would meet the, the expectations of. Okay, so that's the motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. <clears throat> and um, Councilor Cohen, when we bro uh, spoke offline with regard to the process, I think specifically you were contemplating something that could be developer funded, but have city staff selecting consultants is, is, is that what you had yeah i mean i don't I, I didn't want to over specify in my motion right now but i yeah. guess just for some the sake of discussion I, the idea is if there's a concern about how who's picking a consultant there would be a you know in theory the process could say the city will pick the consultant the city will have some oversight staff that will make sure that the process is being followed but it won't necessarily have to be staffed as heavily because the you know, the, the funding is coming from somewhere else to, to staff it. But I, I want to leave it up to you about what that process could look like without over-specifying now. Well, and I think a related issue to the consult, like who pays for the consultant, who they work for, is who sets the scope, right? So right. I think what we're advocating for is that, that staff, the city establishes the scope, not not the developer. So that, that's, I mean, what we can come back, when we come back, we can talk yeah, you about come, that. They come back yeah. with that recommendation. Yeah. Okay. And Councilor, do we have a timeline for your motion? I didn't want to, I didn't want to, since there's some work you'd have to do before coming back, I didn't want to say. Yeah, I'm just cognizant know. that I know tne has been talking about this over the past year. I wouldn't want to let it go too yeah, long. Yeah, as quickly as soon as possible, I guess is my answer. End of January, I don't know what you're. 
So, council member, uh, certainly we'll be working on this as quickly as possible. One of the, the challenges of getting back to council quickly is the timeline and process around getting the memo written and getting it in through okay, so our process. So that, that's usually what pushes us back. It's about a six week turnaround. process. So six weeks? Yeah. To write the memo, get it about a month through the process and internally, it, it's about, yeah. Mid-February. So, it, uh, no, it's probably more likely a March. Oh, okay. So um, I'm just trying to think through timeline implications. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't think we'd make it back in January. We'd certainly push to get it back end of February. Would it help just to go back to council rather than to the committee? Would, yeah, yeah, to council. Yeah. All right. Yeah, to council so by to take a time aim off. for end of February. I mean, I certainly think everyone here is flexible. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, there's the motion, Councilmember Foley. Okay, now I'm really confused. So, the, obviously this is a real confusing issue and we've gone back and forth. So, I just wanna clarify what you're trying to do, Council Member Cohen, and that is you, you've you moved the mayor's memo no. and- No. The staff recommendation. The staff recommendation. Okay, so and the mayor's Council memo's not, not on the table and neither is the Paralysis Davis memos on the table, but the Jimenez is? Jimenez is. That's correct. But those other two are not off the table. They're just not invited. They're not part of the motion. Okay. Yeah. S but there is direction under the motion to address the two the the two memos and bring back a staff recommendation. Okay. A staff recommendation that really uh bypassed or ignored or denied, let's, let me put it that way, a T&E recommendation initially. So you're saying send it back to staff, bring it back to council, not to T&E, for vetting and, and uh, approval or more sausage making at that time. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, I mean, I imagine we're going, I mean, I imagine I will, you know, honestly will support something like what came through T&E and the council member for Allison Davis's memo, but that there's probably some additions and amendments that have to be made to make sure that some of the concerns that the mayor has in his memo are addressed. And, and so I just didn't wanna try to rush those amendment edits tonight and thought they'd be better off having that in a more thoughtful process coming back. To yeah, and I don't disagree with that. I, I think this is a really confusing issue and one that I've had several presentations on over the last year or so and discussions with lots of different people. So my concern about waiting and not making a decision here is that we have a brand new council coming in who knows nothing about this issue. And so we're going to, there's gonna be a lot of education to have to be done with the new council in order to get them up to speed. So I just wanna be, really aware that that's what we're working with whether we bring whether it come back from staff on february or march we still have a council coming in with an issue that is really really complicated to us and we've been sitting here listening to this for a while so i i i don't know where i'm going to go on this this motion but so i guess i'll just hear what other people have to say but uh it's it's a direction that may be the right way to go, but I'm concerned about bringing the other council up to speed and how we're going to do that. So I'll just leave it at that. Uh, Councilmember uh, Mahan. Sure, yeah, I just thought maybe I'd take a stab at clarifying what I'd hope to get out of this by seconding. Um, I think we move forward the staff recommendation. There's a lot of good stuff in there and a huge part of the body of the work here would be checked off and done and moving forward, which is good. We incorporate Council Member Jimenez's memo, which is great, and then we have these two conflicting memos, and to me, the heart of the conflict is this question of who leads the community engagement process. And I think some of, we have concerns that if it's fully city-led, it may be too slow, too onerous, it may make projects infeasible. I have that concern, at least, and I've heard others express that, and I think that's behind the Davis and Perales memo. On the other hand, 
Um, I think some of us are a little uncomfortable with the idea that with few guardrails, this would be a developer-led process that may not take into account all of the things that the city has a public interest in considering, particularly for large parcels. And so I think the suggestion that Councilor Cohen made earlier that was also on my list, and I just forgot to ask, which I think is a great one, is, is there some minimum standard and some process by which the, cons the community engagement consultant could be selected that would get us comfortable with the developer-led process, that would get to the end, the goal that the Councilmember Davis and Perales memo has laid out there, but with appropriate guardrails and protections so that the community has confidence that we're still playing our role in, in protecting the public interest and making sure that the community engagement process is sufficiently um, comprehensive and, and independent. Basically, I think that's that's what we're. I think that is what's at least seems to me to be at the heart of the matter here. I don't love pushing this any farther along, but if we could get back by the end of February and get an answer to a more hybrid approach, where we set some of those public standards and guidelines, but ultimately get to a place where we're comfortable with the developer funding and driving a faster community engagement process, I think that would be a win. Okay, uh, Councilmember Perales. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna try to clean this up a little bit. It may make uh, it more uh, palatable and feasible for the, the incoming council, because I would agree with Council Member Foley. This is actually something that t &E has been at for almost two years. Um, and so if, if this council can't vet it out through committee and then come to a conclusion, um, <laughs> I don't see where it's gonna be very easy for a new council. But Councilmember Mayhan nailed where the, the conflict has, has risen today. And it's really in recommendation number two, I'll refer to that one within the memo from myself and Councilmember Davis. And that's on who's leading this process. What does that community, extension of community you know, engagement process look like? Um, I think there's a lot of meat and potatoes in recommendation one from myself and Councilmember Davis. And there's obviously some disagreement from staff on that. There was a, a, a unanimous recommendation out of committee on that. I, I don't think that needs to come back. And currently the, the substitute motion would be moving the original staff recommendation that doesn't include any of that, which wouldn't include any of the debate and the discussion that I've had for a year over a year with staff and wouldn't include the recommendation that the, the t and &E committee made unanimously. Um, but we could resolve that um, and also ask for a friendly amendment if Councilmember Cohen, you could include recommendation one and recommendation three. Uh, staff's already said they're comfortable with recommendation three from, from our memo, but recommendation one, and essentially leave out recommendation two. I'm fine with, you know, uh, let the future council or let, let, you know, next year in March, you guys decide what does that community engagement look like? I have my opinion, but I can set that aside and say, sure, you guys can have that discussion in the future, but at least what it does is it takes out the real nuanced discussion on the VMT policy on you know where we might and how we might vet out these projects. And all it does is it narrows it down to what uh, Councilman Mayhem just, just stated is the real core of the, the, the debate we've had tonight, which is on who's leading that community engagement process. And so I'll ask for a friendly amendment if you can include that recommendation one and three from um, the, the memo from myself and Council Member Davis. And then what you've asked for essentially the discussion next year will simply be on that that second portion of it. I, I'm okay with that with one addition, which is bring back, is, is include in that next discussion, the discussion about the right amount of inclusionary housing to be part of the 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 accepted, the exception that we discuss. But beyond that, I'm, I'm okay with including one and three if the seconder is okay with it. Sure. I'll go back since uh, the memo has changed or the measure has changed. I'll ask Councilor Cohen if they'd be willing, he'd be willing to accept a friendly amendment to say um, that the amount of affordable housing should be something greater than the citywide requirement. Because right now, the T and E committee has recommended essentially something any developer could comply with um, the existing citywide requirement uh, and be able to get this remarkable uh, benefit from the city to be able to build in this area that the general plan would order not allow. Well, that was part of my original motion, so I, I'm happy to keep that in. I mean, sort okay. of intended to keep that in there. I guess what I said was, when I was saying yes with this change, I meant yes, but keep including the, the stricter okay. affordable housing portion. Okay, I'd be happy to support that as well. 
<clears throat> All right. Uh, other. Restate the last uh, statement. Councilman Prowse, your hand's still up. Yes, yeah, sorry. Can, can you restate the last um, portion, Councilman Cohen, that you just mentioned? Yeah, I mean, I, the, the recommendation that, that the mayor had in his memo was for much higher, like 40% inclusionary affordable housing. What I'm suggesting is that we will have, an, we should have a number above the current citywide number of 15% in the final policy. Okay, so, because uh, yeah, our recommendation one, um, right, um, included that as well as some of the, the recommendations we had made back in TE. We obviously wanted to keep it more broad than a percentage, but you're, so you're saying it would be at least just more than the current minimum that we have that 15%, not necessarily 45 to 50% or even 35% as suggested by staff, right? right. Right, okay. Not yet. I mean, we'll, that'll, that'll be part of the conversation when it comes That's, back. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, Councilmember Member Sparson. Could, uh, could you restate the entire motion, please? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> do you want me to, you want me to take, I can, I can take uh, a crack. I, 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 <laughs> I wrote it down. But if you want to, since you wrote it down, why don't you go ahead then and repeat it? Yeah, sorry, you wrote it down. I, I wrote it down if you want. So it's, the motion is staff recommendation plus per Allison Davis's memo recommendations one and three plus come back in February to council to discuss uh, an engage discuss uh, engagement process options. Um, essentially looking at how we could do um, well, maybe I need some help here, but how we can, is, what, what is a pro, what, what's an engagement process that would involve the developer and city staff that would be a, a more streamlined process than might otherwise occur? What would that look Was like? it, can, can I just get some clarity? Cause uh, so that part is, uh, it comes back to council in February uh, with an engagement process, engagement process options is this to keep it developer led and the city would be no no i think i think so my understanding correct me if i'm wrong is staff would come back a, a recommendation of what a development process could look like there could be some options that would get to the council's desire to move um a process through quickly and not have it drift on for years if that is that sound right does that include both city-led and developer-led options Councilor Cohen, do you want to? I think I, I would defer to council want... on that one. And before you, before we finish that, I just want to make the other recommendation just to be clear: is that a step that um, tonight we would establish an affordable house. The council wants to establish an a, 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 an affordable housing requirement or criteria that a project must much do provide affordable housing greater than the minimum IHO requirements currently. I'll turn it back to you. I think, and then also the Jimenez memo. Well, so the Jimenez memo, uh, okay, yes. got it. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Uh, and thanks, everybody, because I, I agree with Council Member Foley. There's going to be a large number of new folks coming in. And I remember, I, I don't know if she has any PTSD about this, but I remember coming in as a brand new council member, and we had had the garbage contract uh, kicked out um to january and it was originally going to be like the i think the second tuesday of january and we were scrambling and had so much to learn on top of everything else and i think it got kicked out a little like a week or two more but it, it was a big thing and i think uh i think uh this compromise moves this forward and um will offer a meaningful decisions and discussion for council in the next year but without really uh, uh, <laughs> killing them. <laughs> All right, thank you. Can I just get one clarification when we come back in February on what we should be bringing back to, is it, I, I just wanna hear a clarification on that. I know it's about public engagement and the process, but a little more clarification on that. Do you wanna go? Okay. I, I think the spirit of it is we wanna see a community engagement process that balances the city's desire to think holistically about 
the planning process and, and various factors beyond a single project that retains community trust and keeps the community in the driver's seat, uh, but that also meets the needs of developers who frequently complain that we are too slow and create too many barriers. And one suggestion I heard, I don't think this is exclusive, but Council Member Cohen said, I think he sort of postulated, you know, could there be a set of requirements, including the city vetting or approving or hiring the community engagement consultant that would then make us comfortable with the developer leading the process? So is there a hybrid approach here where we set some standards, very well could include the selection of the community engagement consultant, but at that point, the developer leads and drives a, a process that's hopefully faster and meets their needs. And, and where is that kind of compromise or hybrid approach? And there might be a few different alternatives you want to give us. But that was at least what I, what I heard and signed up for. And sorry, council member, just uh, it would be helpful to get some additional clarity on uh, the matter of the scope Right, and so who dictates and how we sort of think about this. Correct, scope. that and was that another consideration you raised beyond who is the consultant leading the community engagement process is uh, what is the scope of the community, uh, what the community's weighing in on. So or, we'll, bring, we'll bring that back as part of that recommendation in February. Yeah, but I do think the spirit very much was to be responsive to the concerns that council members Perales and Davis raised in their memo. Okay, Councilmember Perales, your hand is still up. Yeah, I wanted to just make a <laughs> clarification. Um, the the motion, only because Councilmember Cohen said staff recommendation, and then uh, I know in Michael's reiteration over here is staff recommendation. Uh, just to be clear, we're also stating that in our, our memo, but because there was a lot of recommendations around, uh, running around, we made it very clear what resolution in our memo, and that's why I said recommendation one. So I just want to make that clear with everybody that it's, it is the staff memo, but it is specifically the resolution T and E committee recommendation with additional staff edits, and then, and then we made a couple word changes there, which Councilmember Cohen made another one too. But I just wanted to make that clear that it's that's the that's the language we're going with on the resolution. Correct. Yep. Correct. Okay. Great. And then a one word of caution. I hope that you know as this comes back next year. As um, I think, you know, as is is very possible, um, you know, it could get delayed. Simply, you know, even this step, which is, hey, what is the right pathway to go? Um, that could delay, you know, the progress even further for particular opportunities. And um, I think that, you know, I, I'll go back to what Councilmember Mayhem was saying: is that maybe there needs to be a cutoff, right? And even in this process of determining <laughs> determining the right process, uh, I, I would hope the council kind of sets a, a limit point and says, hey, we don't want to study this to death or, or try to understand the best pathway that, that uh, don't let perfect be, be uh, enemy of the good here. Um, we don't want to get in our own way. So I just caution my colleagues that will be here next year and hope that you, you stay on top of this uh, because the new council members won't be aware uh, and you all will. And so hopefully you'll be able to stay on top of it and, and, and call the question at some point to say, hey, we need to find a, a way to move forward and not uh, and drag it out further. So, but uh, I will support the motion. Thanks. All right. Speaking of calling the question. Nope. Uh, Councilmember Jimenez. Yeah, just one question. I was wondering if planning staff can, can touch on how they see the recent submission of an application general plan amendment uh, as it relates to this site, how they see that interacting with this decision to bring this forward as directed by staff tonight. I'm, try I'm trying to understand the process here and how, how it interacts. Yeah, I mean, the general plan amendment process is a, is a pretty lengthy process. So I think um, we really would need to get council resolution on this issue. Um, you know, before, I mean, the, I, before it, we would bring the general plan amendment to, to council. So okay. the, I mean, I mean, I think at best best scenario, and it's it may be longer than this because of for various reasons, but um, would be a year for the general plan amendment to come back. Likely longer than that. Okay. Yeah, I know they take a while. I was just just thinking out loud, just trying to sort of play out how it's going to sort of take shape. But okay, I'll I'll leave additional questions to the future so we can go and go to bed. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Menes. Is there anything else? Any other comments or questions? All right, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? 
Carrasco? Aye. Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Motion passes. All right. Uh, we now have time for open forum. Marine and Blair, come down to the front in whatever order. Hi, Blair Beekman. Thanks for the meeting tonight. Interesting meeting. A simple formula of good democracy in San Jose for the next few years may be how our everyday community and local government can listen to open good reasoning from all sides and from this work to create fair compromise for all sides. With good listening and good steps together in the next year, we can, be, we can bring about an easier dialogue and process uh, for 2024 and 25 that many are planning and hoping for as the beginnings of our better human ideals and practices for our human future. As part of this hopeful future, I hope we can learn to better channel our anger and frustration constructively and in how we can all work to try to agree with each other at some level in what can be an open good democracy of this republic as a local community and as a country. And to try to better speak to my T&E committee open forum of yesterday in what Gover Governor Gavin Newsom, local governments and everyday community of the SF Bay Area have been working towards for years now Good luck in the continued efforts to lessen the influence, overreach, and profit motive of fossil fuel companies in the future of California and renewable energy goals. And from this, how to try to develop well-intentioned compromise for what may be a difficult mid-December CPEC vote. And how we can work at this time for the future of residential solar subsidies to continue to be an open and accessible process to all levels of income and towards a more hopeful future of good renewable energy practices. Thanks again for the meeting today. Thank you. Paul Soto. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Hi there, guys. Uh, I'm Jesse Noble here again. I uh, was here the other day talking about the that Noble project. Um, um, so I don't know if you guys remember back in 2019, I came in here back in March um, wanting to launch a cannabis project um, in District 3. I was asking for um, Council Member Perales um, and he sent someone upstairs to, uh, or he sent someone from his office to come down and talk to me that day. Um, and so we got things rolling a little bit, like I got a couple of introductions. Um, to people, but then the pandemic hit and it kind of like killed all the momentum that I had going uh, up until then. And so I'm trying to resume that now um, with like the economic development and cultural affairs. Uh, that's where I figured I should start. Um, but it's kind of stalling there too. And so um, I'm just here to ask how to expedite this. Um, because I've never been through it before. Um, um, now, probably the, the couple of like short list sites that I have to, to open in, uh, it looks like it might be District 4 now, um, but I'd really rather be downtown. Um, and so there's, a, there's uh, some grant money uh, that Sacramento set aside for this. Um, there's a couple different grants actually. Um, and. I went into it briefly before, but I mean, I got all the information in the world to talk about this with somebody and I like chomping at the bit, rearing to go. Um, it's just, it's, it's just a perfect, perfect project that the community really needs. Um, and I just want to talk about it with someone, you know, get it going. So S sir, I'm just here open-endedly asking that. Yes, yeah, so sir, I, um, our assistant city manager, Lee Wilcox, can talk to you offline. Okay. Okay? And get okay. you going, okay? Cool. Great. Thank you. Paul Soto. Uh, uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, Gary Dillabold made a statement 
and I'd like to read it back. It was interesting. He stated that he was going to build, uh, and I quote, the East Side deserves world-class development and something that they could be proud of. Well, I'd like to inform this guest to my city that we already have things that we are very, very proud of in the city of San Jose. The East Side of San Jose is the birthplace of three of the most powerful civil rights movements in the 20th century. It is the home of the farm workers movement, it is the home of the Chicano movement, and it is home of the lowrider movement. And so this kind of like cavalier condescending attitude that the developers uh, take towards my city, um, I think they need an education. Uh, money does not connote uh, intelligence, nor does it connote character or uh, or, uh, and, 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 and on the flip side, nor does poverty connote lack thereof. Um, I'd like to inform the city that the Smithsonian Museum is putting on a display of the lowrider culture. They're going to include uh, the uh, signs, and they're also going to have a permanent display of lowrider culture and lowrider history. I'm proud to inform the city that I'm going to be in contact with the Smithsonian, and they want to talk to me about the... Uh, the uh, historical landmark designation of the first headquarters of Lowrider Magazine. And I'm very proud of that, very, very proud of that. It's sad that the city can't share in that pride with me. That, that, that's very sad, I'm very saddened by that uh, because it, it, it is a moment in time where San Jose can be installed in the Smithsonian Museum with respect to the Lowrider movement and the Lowrider culture because you can't talk about Lowrider culture without talking about its first headquarters, which is right. Ali Saperman. Hi, Ali Saperman here. I didn't get a chance to speak to 2.10 on the consent calendar this morning, but I just wanted to thank council uh, for passing um, uh, that memo uh, in the respect of the marriage act. It's really, really critical for our community. So just really thankful for your leadership there. Um, also, congrats on becoming the largest city to eliminate parking minimums. Hope you can go to bed uh, knowing you did San Jose well tonight. Thank you. Back to council. Okay, uh, the meeting's adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Okay.